Okay, good morning everybody and uh, welcome to this Working Well Together University Designer Awareness Day. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, preventing occupational ill health uh, through design. My name is Philip Baker. Um, amongst other things, I'm chair of this Working Well Together group uh, at London North West. So you've had a chance to have a look at this, uh, this picture uh, earlier. Anybody like to suggest to me which one or ones of these diseases are covered by the CDM regulations? No? 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 Okay, so C CDM is all about the well-being of construction workers. So uh, it's not all of them and it's not none of them. Um, so tunnelling disease, tunnelling is a construction operation, CDM asks us to think about the well-being, the health safety of construction workers. Uh, similarly working in a caisson uh, uh, is a construction operation and painting is also a, co a construction operation. So it's those three that are covered by CDM and, and arguably housemaid's knee, we'll come back to housemaid's knee uh, later on. So as I say, you're very welcome. There isn't a bell test today, so if the fire alarms go off, then the marked escape routes, there's one there and there's, there's one there. And the assembly point is out behind us under the tree. If we need any first aid, uh, we'll go to the reception desk. The toilets are just out of the door here to the left. Please turn your phones to silent. Uh, this presentation was originally made for APS, and uh, some other people contributed to it as well. Uh, but these are my personal views, and I will talk about the law, but I'm not legally trained. You can have a set of the, the notes afterwards. Um, we can get them to you electronically. Uh, and if you'd like that, if you leave your uh, email address on the, the registration sheet, please ask questions as we go through, because that's the way you're going to get the best out of the day. And some of the images here are taken from the, from the web, um, for which I thank the... Uh, the uh, owners of the intellectual rights, but we're also filming today and taking pictures, but it's the back of your heads that will be seen, if anything, so that's why we haven't uh, asked for permission, because your, your faces won't be shown. But if, you, if you're worried about it, then if you just keep to one side of the room, then, you're, then you'll be all right. So I say we developed this presentation for, for APS, uh, but these other organisations contributed to it, they, they critiqued it, so CITB, Higher Safety, Constructing Better Health and the Health and Safety Executive. The event is run, being run by Working Well Together. Working Well Together is an organisation that provides for the industry, by the industry. Uh, we do a number of things, Designers Awareness Day is one of them, Safety and Health Awareness Day is another. Uh, and if you'd like to know more about the Working Well Together, you can find us on the web and we'd be delighted to have you on our little uh, steering group. Margaret and, and Alex are on the, on the steering group for that. And thank you to Overbury, who've uh, supported us today, provide the refreshments, uh, and made this room available. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is we're going to, first of all, unsurprisingly, talk about what are the problems uh, to do with health and safety, but predominantly health in the construction industry. Um, and then we're going to see what we can do about them, because that's the, you know, it's fine and dandy knowing the problems, but we need to know what we can do about it. So we're going to look at harms to health in the industry, the importance of prevention through design, why designers should do something. We'll look at the general principles of prevention, which is a set of uh, rules that we have to follow, or we should follow when we're making those decisions about health and safety. We'll look at the role that the contractor has to play, because uh, too often uh, the design community just doesn't worry about it and says the contractor can sort, about it, sort it out, but we'll see what the contractor has to do. We'll look at so far as reasonably practicable, uh, again, which is one of the tenets of uh, health and safety. We'll just touch on BIM, and then we'll get into, so what can designers do? What can designers do uh, about health uh, issues in the construction phase, the, the build that, that will result from our design? Uh, what about in use, when the building's in use, or the structure's in use? And then what about when we come along later on after practical completion, after the building's been builded, built over the next 60 years or whatever the design life is to do more construction work, what should we be thinking about? And then we'll look at other sources of information. Mm -hmm. So any questions before we get going? No? 
Okay, let's look at uh, harms uh, in the construction industry. So this is um, the blue bars are the number of people that we've killed in the construction industry um, over the last 20 or 30 years. And as you can see, there's been a significant improvement. Statistically, we actually need to look at the incident rate. So that's the number of people killed per 100,000 uh, workers, and, and that's the blue line. And we're doing pretty well. Uh, we used to kill one person a day in the industry, and now we only kill one person a week. Shouldn't be complacent about it, but um, it, you know we have seen a dramatic improvement. It was down to 39 last the year before last, and then it crept back up to 43 last year. These are deaths that result from safety accidents. Um, if all we're thinking about is is these safety-related deaths, then we're missing the big picture. Three quarters of the working time lost in the construction industry in this country is due to ill health, and that's why we're talking about preventing. Uh, ill health through design today. And the, 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 uh, the related graph to health, to the, the one I showed you before about safety, shows that we've actually made little improvement. The HSC described it as broadly flat. So after, over the last 10 years, we've seen a 6% improvement in ill health deaths in the construction industry, whereas over the same period, we saw a 46% improvement in safety-related deaths. Now, part of that is due to the fact that uh, these diseases take longer to kill people than falling off a ladder, for example, which is, which is very immediate, um, and partly because these aren't obvious, which is why we're talking about it. Uh, a safety-related accident, you see it straight away. If somebody breathes something in which causes them a disease, then you might not know about it. In fact, you might never know about it because when they finally die, they won't be working on a construction site. They'll, be, they'll have been retired out of the industry for some time. Sadly, they'll have gone from people's memories generally, um, and they'll be in some medical facility somewhere. So it, it's the lack of visibility that's the, that's the real problem. So work that was done by Dr. Leslie Rushton at Imperial College. She was looking at the causes of cancer in UK from all work. Uh, and then they pulled out the, the data for uh, cancer-related deaths in the construction industry. Actually, she wasn't looking at deaths. She was looking at registrations. So registration is when somebody's unwell, they go to the doctor, the doctor does some tests and says, I'm sorry to tell you, you've got cancer. That's, that's, that's a registration. And, and hopefully you won't be surprised that asbestos is at the top of the list. Uh, in this country, about 5,500 people die every year from asbestos-related diseases. But you might be surprised that solar radiation is second on the list. 841 registrations every year. Um, luckily, I will say luckily, not lucky for the 60 people who die, but luckily that only results in about 60 deaths a year because melanoma is quite a treatable disease. And then we've got silica. So 701 registrations from silica uh, accounts for about 850 deaths a year at the moment. And um, that's our second biggest challenge. Uh, actually, it's probably our biggest challenge. I think we've, we've got asbestos, we understand it, uh, although there are still some heinous activities carried on in the industry, um, uh, both because of design and because of the way contractors behave. But silicas, I think, is the one that people aren't getting their head around. Polyaromatic hydrocarbons, coal tars and pitches. There are a number of abbreviations in the presentation. If I don't tell you what they are, then please ask. 471. Painters and decorators, 344 registrations, about 250 deaths a year. Um, and the HSC initially said, well, that was due to the stuff that was in the paint in the, in the 80s and 90s, the legacy issue. But actually then they changed their mind uh, and they decided to do a bit more research. Five years they've been doing that research and uh, the Painting and Decorating Association Health and Safety Committee met yesterday and I, I prompted them to ask, you know, when are we going to get the answers? Because, you know, if we know the answers, then we could do something about it. And diesel engine exhaust emissions, this um, research actually produced uh, the evidence that diesel engine exhaust emissions were a class one carcinogen. And recently we've had a warning about fumes created by heating mild steel, heating it to the temperature which it will cut, uh, to cut it, uh, which are also class one carcinogen. And then other causes of ill health, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, is caused by breathing in general dusts, uh, wood dusts and uh, you know, all sorts of uh, dusts on site. COPD accounts for about 350 deaths across all industries uh, in the UK. Again, there's a legacy issue there from, from mining. 
uh, but certainly we've made our contribution in the construction industry. And you'll be aware that various contractors, I hope, have got ban the broom um, initiatives in place to do that. And, and Overby sponsored some research from uh, the boys at Queen Elizabeth School Barnet into you know, how we might deal with that better on construction sites. Dermatitis, hand on vibration syndrome caused by um, vibrating tools and musculoskeletal disorders. Biggest cause of absence from any workplace uh, is musculoskeletal disorders. And, and no, you won't be surprised, we'll be looking at that later on. How else might you look at the figures? So industrial injuries, disablement benefit, um, predominantly lung diseases. This is, you know, if you're ill, caused, your illness is, made, um, is caused by your work, then you're entitled to claim uh, benefit off the state. Um, the numbers were changed because osteoarthritis of the knee was introduced as a, as a claimable um, disease uh, a couple of years ago. Um, osteoarthritis of the knee, housemaid's knee, we call it colloquially, of course, when we're thinking about laying carpets, tiles, floors, etc., when the, the people are working on their knees, then that's what causes it. Industrial deafness, construction industry is the, the biggest uh, current causer of industrial deafness. It used to be mining, but it's now a, a heavy industry, but it's now construction. Uh, asthma, actually, um, flower dust is the biggest, one of the biggest causes of asthma. We have our asthmagens in the industry, isocyanates and things like that, and paints. And dermatitis. The big industry for dermatitis is hair care because the products are used. But again, we have our share of dermatitis in this, uh, in this industry. So as I said earlier, health, it doesn't get the focus that it needs. It is a Cinderella part of health and safety. Um, and it's partly to do with the latency. The government was asked uh, if they were actually aware of what the toll of ill health were. And they said, actually, they didn't have any idea. But uh, other research has shown that half of construction workers were retired before the age of 60. They will just invalid themselves out of the industry because of the, the harm that the industry causes to them. And we talked about the tangibility. Um, on the left-hand side here, we see work-related illness. On the right-hand side, safety-related issues. And you can see constructions down here. Um, where's construction? There's construction. The rates, the rates per 100,000 workers are about the same. So when you're working on a construction site and, for example, somebody hits their thumb with a hammer, which is a very tangible safety issue, for every one of those safety issues, there's a health issue. We just don't see it uh, because somebody's breathed something in, or they've got a, a dose of vibration or something. So um, it, it's the same rate for the two. The Health Safety Executive's um, initiative with the, with the country as a whole, uh, helping Great Britain work well, identified um, that we'd had seen a small reduction in occupational ill health. And some of the language we talk about, so we mix these, these three up in, in the industry. So we've got occupational hygiene, which tends to be a specialist uh, occupational hygienist, they're called, uh, and their professional institution, one of them is the British Occupational Hygiene Society. Then you've got occupational health, um, which health and safety people deal with, and then we get well-being, and a lot of contractors are now moving into the, the well-being sphere, um, and you'll see today that over you provided us with fruit, um, because it's good for us, as well as the other things which we like which aren't necessarily good for us. Yeah? So the area that we're looking at as designers is, this, is the occupational ill health. So any questions before we move on? No? Okay, this graph shows the, the ability to reduce risk and the cost of doing that. And what we understand in the industry that is that risk is high at the beginning of projects until we start to intervene. Uh, and at the beginning of projects, it's relatively cheap to eliminate risk and then as we go through the project it becomes more and more expensive to eliminate risk and more difficult to do that as we go through the design process we lock in design choices um, and if we haven't considered health and safety or health particularly uh, then it's difficult to remove those as we go later on so here's a, here's an example this is a housing estate in slough i was on the estate uh, i wasn't flying over it i was on the estate uh, doing a health and safety inspection on some painters and decorators who'd come along later on to do some painting and decorating. And I went on the site, and this is what I saw. 
So, so what did I see? You have to get yourself into my frame of mind. You might not want to get yourself into my frame of mind. What do you think I saw? Looking up the road, that's what I saw? No? Yeah. What I saw was overhead power cables. Okay. I, of course, I saw the nice public open space, but, but I saw the overhead power cables as well. And I thought, oh, that's quite interesting in terms of the layout of the estate. So I went back and got, me, got my map up, my aerial map of the estate, and I plotted on the overhead power cables. And it looks like the designers made good choices because it's very difficult to work safely under overhead power cables because the machinery, the scaffolding, etc., reduces the, the distance of the cables and increases the light of a short. So of choice, you wouldn't want to build underneath overhead power cables. And it looks like this is what the designers have done. In the layout of this estate, they've put the houses remote from the overhead cables to reduce the risk that the contractor had to, to manage on site. Yeah. Some people say I'm anti-kite flying, uh, but there you are. I like kite flying, but it's better to have the public open space under the overhead power cables where it poses no risk than trying to build underneath it. So why should we do something? Uh, three, we look at three reasons. We've got the moral, the economic, and the, and the legal. For me, the, the toll of harm that I showed you at the beginning is a perfect reason for why we should try and do something about it whatever our sphere is. So as a designer, as a principal designer, we work with design teams, we try and get them to address the issues in their design. In my private life, uh, if there is such a thing, you know, I work with working to well together where we try and bring these issues to the attention of small designers in our safety and small contractors in our safety and health awareness day. So, so for me, there's, there's an obligation. There's quite a significant amount of harm uh, caused in the industry and we should do something about it. And the industry is changing. Uh, 25 years ago, when CDM was first introduced, the industry was largely made up of large contractors, and it was the large contractors uh, who were killing people. Now the industry is predominantly small contractors uh, because of the nature of, um, of work, um, I guess, and we see companies going to, to the wall from time to time. And now about three quarters of major incidents, accidents, actually occur on small projects, projects that have got fewer than 10 people working on them. And the health and safety executive have changed their plan of work and they've tried to focus on simplification. A chap called James Reason did some research into the causes of uh, health and safety incidents and he, uh, he suggested that, well, it wasn't rocket science really, the first part, you know, the world is full of hazards. We will never live in a hazard-free environment. And if we don't put the right protections in place, those, those, we get a vector for the hazard to result in an incident. And he modelled people's capabilities as pieces of Swiss cheese. And, and you won't be surprised, this is called the Swiss cheese model. It'd be nice if it had been called the James Reason model, but actually it's called the Swiss cheese model. So what he was saying, that he said nobody's perfect. And he modelled people's imperfections by the holes in Swiss cheese. So the size of holes and the number of holes represents people's imperfections. And where those all line up, we get this vector for the hazards that are in the world all, all around to result in an incident because nobody does anything about it. And too often when I'm talking to actors in the construction industry, they start pointing their finger. Yeah? So if you talk to contractors, they say, well, if only designers sorted things out. If you talk to designers, they say, well, if only the contractor. And then everybody says, well, if only the client paid a little bit more money. or gave it. So everybody's pointing their fingers. What, what Reason asks us to do is look at our own performance. He says, if we can reduce the size and number of holes in our own performance, our own incapabilities, then we eliminate the vector for the hazard to result in an incident. Yeah? So, yeah, sure, we work with other, other parts trying to do things, but Reason's premise is, if you work on your own performance, then you stand a chance of reducing this vector uh, for the hazard to result in an incident. And post Grenfell, the Institution of Civil Engineers have done some research. Uh, they've produced a report called In Plain Sight, which identifies that there are several actors in the, in the process, and they've used the Swiss cheese model, and they call them lines of defense. The, the Swiss cheeses, they call them lines of defense. We all have an opportunity prevent uh, hazards result in, in incidents by the way we behave. Economically, uh, we reckon that ill health is costing the construction industry £9.4 billion a year. Huh? 
um, which is a significant amount of money. Um, and if we stopped harming people, not only would we recover the 9.4 billion back into the construction industry, uh, but of course we would take the burden off the health service, which has to deal with these people that we push out the other end. Okay? And three quarters of the industry are self-employed, and when a self-employed person gets ill, they carry on going to work because they have no choice. If they're not at work, they're not earning money. Uh, and it's suggested that presenteeism, people turning up to work ill, costs the industry twice as much as absenteeism. So if the people just stayed away from work, it would cost half as much as turning up to work and being incapable or, or uh, compromised in the ability to do things. Legally, our top piece of health and safety legislation is the Health and Safety at Work Act. It's got a number of sections. Section 2 requires employers to think about the well-being of employees. Section 3 requires employers to think about the well-being of people who are not in their employment. And that's what we have in the construction industry. In the design side, uh, the designers are not employing the construction workers. So we have this Section 3 relationship uh, where we as designers need to think about the well-being of construction workers. So it's, it's embedded in the Health and Safety at Work Act. That's since 1974. It's proved to be a, a good piece of legislation and it's amplified by designers' duties under CDM um, and, and also duties for the, for the client uh, under CDM. From time to time, actually every year, the Health and Safety Executives spend four weeks where they take all their resources and they focus them on uh, inspections in the construction industry. And their targets are the refurbishment sector and sites that employ fewer than 10 people. And consistently, year on year, they find that about half of the sites they visit do not come up to standard for, for various reasons. Okay? Um, and they're starting more and more to focus on health. So we just had a, a brief report. It was covered in the Health and Safety Executive Board Minutes. Um, for the initiative that they carried out in October and September, October and November last year. And again, we got it's 43%. So it's getting better, arguably, but maybe not statistically. But it's still about half of construction sites not coming up to scratch. And you might be thinking, well, oh, that's contractors for you. Actually, I'm thinking, why are we as designers leaving risks in our design that are clearly too difficult for contractors to manage? And we'll talk about what is significant risk later on uh, as we go through the presentation. Yeah. Back in uh, 2015, the HSC reinforced the point that they've been making for some time, that if they see a breach on a construction site uh, and they can see the link back to the design fraternity, they will go back. Uh, and I'll give you an example later on of whether we're using uh, plasterboard on site. Uh, and the HSC have... They've taken to the contractor to task because he wasn't doing the things right on site, but he's gone back, they've gone back to the design team and asked them the question why. And so if that's what frightens you, then, then the legal position's out there. The Chief Inspector of Construction reiterated the point that things need to be done. He talked about them being done in design as well as in execution. He reinforced the point that it needs to be done in design. And he, he reinforced this little, this little ratio that we have so that for every person who dies in a safety-related accident, 100 people die from ill health that they catch in the construction industry. Yeah. So if you're thinking about falling from ladders, yes, that's important, and work at height, it is important, but for every person who dies in a safety-related accident, 100 people die from ill health. Yeah. And for every person who dies in a safety-related accident, 10 people in the construction industry take their own lives. And there's quite a lot of work being going on about how we deal with that in terms of uh, mental health first aid on construction sites, but also the Institution of Structural Engineers and, and the Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. We're trying to look more deeply into what are the causes of stress in design practice and construction so we can do something about eliminating them. Yeah? Mental health first aid is, is valuable, but it comes too late, in, in my opinion. We should be doing something about eliminating it before we get the problems arising. Any questions? Okay, we're going to go on to the general principles of prevention. The health and safety executive asked designers to make some choices. Uh, Regulation 9 asks designers to eliminate risks, um, so far as reasonably practicable. We'll talk about so far as reasonably practicable. And when they can't eliminate risks, to reduce them. And when they're doing that, they ask them to take into account the general principles of prevention. 
uh, the general principles of prevention is a hierarchy of choices. Yeah? And uh, I've spread out because it's going to be teamwork, but you've got access to a copy there if you want to pick it up. Um, on this card here, and on the same on the other side, because uh, it's foolproof, I've, I've listed out the general principles of prevention. Yeah? It's, it's a hierarchy of choices. And at the top, we like to do things at the top in preference to other things. So at the top, we've got avoid risks. CDM regulations talk about designers eliminating risks. Right? And, and that's the top of the general principles mentioned. So uh, an example of eliminating risks. We're designing a new building. Uh, we need some heat rejection plant uh, because we put people in the building and they create heat. We need to, we need to get rid of the heat. Um, more and more, we're moving to opening windows, but we still want a bit of heat rejection plant. Where are we going to put that heat rejection, rejection plant? Yeah. And, and usually, the answer is on the roof. Now, the problem with putting it on the roof is that somebody's got to go on, the, well, it's got to be put there in the first instance, but generally the build contractor uh, can manage that better than other contractors. But if it's on the roof, people have got to go on the roof to maintain it. And when they go on the roof to maintain it, there's a risk of them falling off, unless we take other precautionary measures we can, which we can talk about in a minute. Yeah? If they didn't put the air conditioning plant on the roof, nobody could fall off the roof while maintaining it, because they wouldn't be on the roof. So you'll have avoided the hazard. When I have that conversation with designers uh, all around the country, designers' usual response is, I don't have any space anywhere else. I've got a bicycle store and bin store and uh, plant rooms and blah, blah, blah. I need to put it on the roof. When I have that conversation in London, uh, especially in the city of London, actually I don't have the conversation because the designers always find space to put it in the basement. Because of the St Paul's sight lines and the fact they want to get the building taller, they want that extra story as lettable space and if they put the plant on the roof, they'd have to drop a, a story off the building. Yeah? So it is completely doable. So general principles of prevention say, can we avoid the risks? If we can't avoid the risks, so it's got to go on the roof because there isn't any space anywhere else in the building, can we reduce the risk in some way? And the general principles of prevention give us a, a list of choices. So we evaluate the risk, which is to do risk assessment, and we'll talk about designers' risk assessment later on. Can you combat the risk at source? So, for example, if it was a noisy operation, could you select a piece of plant that uh, didn't create so much noise, or could you put it in a, an acoustic enclosure? Could you adapt the work to the individual? So we see this very much in computer workstation setups in terms of the height of the chair and the screen and what have you. Very, all the ergonomic issues would fall into D. Can you adapt to technical progress? Things are happening all the time. Uh, I was judging some... Uh, uh, awards yesterday, Constructing Excellence Awards, and Alex was there with his team of boys from uh, Queen Elizabeth School uh, uh, vying for the Innovation Award um, because things are happening all the time in the industry. So can we adapt to technical progress? Can we replace the dangerous with the non-dangerous or less dangerous? That's a risk reduction. Can we develop a policy? I would suggest that as we don't control the designers, uh, don't control the contractors as designers, creating a policy isn't necessarily a choice. And then we get to protective measures. Uh, I'll just skip on to I. I is instruct the workers. And as I've said before, uh, as designers, we don't instruct the workers. So really, it's not a design choice for us. H is collective protective measures over giving them priority over individual protective measures. So for example, we've got the heat rejection plant on the roof because we couldn't, uh, we couldn't avoid it. We couldn't put it somewhere else in the building. We recognize that people need to go on the roof we've got some choices. We could put a handrail around the roof, we could put a parapet around the roof. Those would be considered to be collective protective measures. Everybody who went on the roof is protected from falling off the roof. Alternatively, we could put on a wire system where the worker had to put on a harness and, and clip onto the wire. And that would be considered to be individual protective measures. And the weakness with the individual protective measures, why, they're, why the collective protective measures are preferred over the individual protective measures, is because the individual protective measures require an individual to do something. So somebody's coming along to maintain the plant on the roof. We've provided a wire system because we couldn't have a parapet or a handrail. We couldn't put the 
uh, air conditioning plant somewhere else. They've got to remember to bring a harness. They've got to be trained in the use of the harness. The harness has got to be inspected and up to date. They've got to be bothered to put the harness on. Uh, they've got to put it on correctly. And when they actually get up on the roof, they've got to be bothered to clip on. Yeah. There's lots of uh, fallibility in the individual collective measures. And that's why it has less priority over the uh, collective protective measures. Yeah. And the HSC did some research uh, into PPE. They looked at seven years, about a million uh, riddle uh, incidents reported. This was the day when <coughs> riddle three days were reported. Six percent of them mentioned personal protective equipment. And when it was uh, drilled down into the figures, what was discovered that for two percent of them, the PPE mention was incidental. So whilst walking along wearing a hard hat, he tripped. Okay, the, trip, the, the hard hat wasn't related to the trip. In 21% of cases, the employer, so the person who's sending the person to site to do the maintenance of the plant on the roof, the employer hadn't thought about PPE. So the person turned up without it. The system's defeated. Okay? Um, in, uh, what is that, is 11% of the cases, the employer thought about it but selected the wrong PPE. In another 21% of the case, 23% of the cases, the employer had provided the PPE, but the worker decided not to use it. And in 6% of the cases, they'd used it incorrectly. So that just amplifies the, the question about the fall fallibility of PPE. Any questions? PPE, by the way, is great. When it's, when it's needed and it's used, it works very well. But if we select PPE over collective protective measures, then we are making it a lesser choice. Any question? Right, then you can, you can play a game. You've got this little card, and on one side of the card it says Windows. And, and work collaboratively here. Um, I'd work with somebody who's worked in the industry before. Okay. Um, we've got to think about, so we're putting Windows into the building, we've got to think about cleaning them and maintaining them. As designers, we need to think about that when we're making that design choice. How are they going to be cleaned and maintained over the life of the building? Yes, we need to think about how they're going to be installed, uh, but we need to be thinking about how they're cleaning and maintaining. On this card here, I've put 11 ways that designers could choose for the windows to be cleaned or maintained. You've got your card here, which is the general principles of invention. What I want you to do is allocate those design choices to the general principles of prevention. So, you've got, got some boxes in the right-hand side here. So, the first one is abseiling. So, if you think abseiling is an example of avoid the risk, you would put a one in this box here. If you think abseiling is an example of individual collective measures, you'd put a one down in this box here where it talks about individual collective measures. Okay? You can do it that way. The alternatively, you can say A is about avoiding the risk. Uh, I'm going to look at this list of 11 choices and decide which ones equate to avoiding the risk. In this box, in this table here, the general principle of prevention, you can have as many letters as you like in these boxes. So if you think all 11 of them are all examples of avoiding the risk, you'd write 1 to 11 in this top box here. Yeah. If you think they're all examples of individual protective measures, you'd write to 1 to 11 in, in, down here. Yeah. But just like Sudoku, you can only use each number once. Okay, any questions? No? Okay, I'll work collaboratively on this. You'll find it easier. Margaret's got all the answers.
Okay, so uh, how did you get on with that? Hard work? Yeah? Yeah? You swatzel done it, I expect. Yeah. Okay, good. The, the HSE require designers to take account of the general principles of prevention, but I would suggest to you that that's quite a hard exercise. But let's go through um, what we think the answers are. So avoid the risk. Ten. Ten? Ten, yeah, ten, and uh, and two, yeah, four, okay, I had four, ten and four, but actually this is about design experience, design choices, okay. uh, anybody get anything for B? Got four, yeah, F for me B in terms of uh, design, it's not a design choice, B is a process, so B is a process where you evaluate the risk, but it doesn't enable you to make it, well, it informs the decision, but it's not a decision in itself. I think it's a process. So I didn't have anything in B, but that's fine. Uh, C, I've got seven. Everybody get, anybody get seven? Yeah? What else did we get? I've got eight, two, yeah, nine, and six. Yeah, quite a lot there. Um, uh, on the ergonomic side, I didn't think there was anything ergonomically that as a design choice we could make. I've got adaptive technical progress. I put three because um, because I like what is it, what's three. Uh, cherry pickers are changing all the time, and if you get a chance to go to a, a shed, a safety and health awareness day, then one of the things we do is we talk about work at height and cherry pickers. Um, and the size of the smallness and the reach and things that are changing all the time. So that's for a designer, I would say that's adaptive technical progress. Um, and then collective protective measures. I've got five and 11 as collective protective measures. Um, so working in a cradle, uh, whether that be a temporary cradle or hanging off the um, building management unit, I would say as a collective protective measure. Uh, and then lastly, I've got abseiling, which is an individual protective measure. Okay? Uh, abseilers would argue that they're higher up the hierarchy than, than that, but they are. It's, it's a, an exercise to illustrate. And, and you've got different answers, which is fine, okay? because there is no right answer. Okay? Um, the next exercise, if you turn the little card over, okay, uh, you've got... Um, You've got, you're thinking about painting something. Okay? It's something that exists, so you've got to prepare the surface before you... It's already been painted. Okay? You've got to prepare the surface before you paint it again. Or do you? Okay? So again, there are 11 choices of the way that you could prepare that surface. And now what I want you to do... Don't, uh, you, you'll have the general principles of French in your mind uh, inherently, but what I want you to do is rank them. In, from safety to safest to most dangerous. So if you think brush off the surface dust is the safest way or the most healthy way to prepare the surface of painting, that would be your number one. If you think it's the least healthy way of preparing the surface of painting, it would be number 11. Okay? Yeah? You're using the same domain knowledge You've got, you should have the general principles of prevention in your, in your head, certainly at high level in terms of eliminate and reduce, um, and, and you need to think about those options. If you've got any questions, I'll, set, I'll tell you what a needle gun is. A needle gun, it's like um, a load of bicycle spokes, and the ends of them are pushed out, so hence, hence needles, they're pushed out, and they create a little chipping action, okay, which chips the paint off. So they're not like a chipping hammer, but they're like a small chipping hammer, and they're pneumatically driven, and, and therefore they're much more effective. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you, you might liken them to a scabula if you were preparing concrete, um, and you're using a scabula, which is also very bad for your health. It creates noise, dust, and vibration. So we try not to do that.
Okay, how did you get on with that? Did you find it more straightforward than using the general principles of invention? Yeah. And, I, and I would tend to suggest that's how you would behave in a, in a design meeting. You wouldn't whip out the general principles of invention and start talking about where it fell onto the hierarchy, but you might be able to talk about this is healthier than that, this is safer than that choice when you were making your design choices. Okay? Uh, and if you don't know the answers, you might ask your principal designer. Okay? Because that's part of what the principal design is all there for. So, so how did we get on? What was everybody's first choice? Seven. Seven. Yeah. Do nothing. Yeah. yeah. And yes, if it's um, if it's cyclical maintenance, it's painting the outside of um, uh, sorry, painting the inside of a building every five years or every three years or every two years. It's actually quite feasible that you would come in and do nothing. When we're painting married quarters, uh, army married quarters, we just go in and we paint them. Uh, because they're painted very frequently. Yeah. Uh, next choice. Two, Two burning. <laughs> Washing with sugar soap. Yeah. yeah. Uh, nobody asked me why I was asking you the question. What's what's in this paint that we're painting on top of? If we scratch the surface, we will create dust and the dust's inhalable, but what might that dust contain? Yes, it might contain lead. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm standing here, I'm your principal designer, and nobody asked the question. Yeah, so so <laughs> just because your principal designer has asked you a question, it's quite all right to ask the why question. Why, you know, why are you asking that question if they haven't articulated it? So you're going to go for uh, washing with sugar soap. What have we got over here, washing with sugar? Okay. Um, actually, my next one is to brush off the surface dust. So cyclical maintenance, um, council houses, etc. Every three years we go in, we just brush off the, they're not particularly healthy, but they're not particularly unhealthy, the dusts that are on the gutters and the, the fascia boards, um, and then we paint on top. And the paint sticks because it was done recently. Next, washing with sugar soap, yeah. So now, now we're washing with sugar soap, we're actually cutting into the surface. So if you're thinking about you need a key, then you're going to need to use one of these other techniques. Because so, one and two don't give you a key. Uh, but but um, washing with sugar soap gives you a key. It's mildly caustic. So you would want to uh, wear some personal protective equipment. Somebody in one of my lectures suggested it was a good way to do a skin peel. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but there you are. Washing with sugar soap. So next then, what's your fourth choice? Wet sanding, wet sanding, yeah, okay. The health and safety executives suggest that it's chemical treatment is next, okay. Now chemical treatment is a strong caustic, okay. It certainly would take the skin off your, your hands and, and what have you. I speak from personal experience, sadly. Um, but using the chemical treatment, you don't create any dust because you put the chemicals on and the paint that you're removing is contained in the, in the mess that you pull off at the end of it. Okay? Because if you create the dust, then it's difficult to manage it. And that's the, that's the rationale but behind putting chemical treatment over the next one. Um, and you're going to go for wet sanding, I'm guessing. Okay? The idea with wet sanding is that, of course, all the dust is contained in the water. You can't breathe it in. The problem with wet sanding commercially is, if you make the surface wet when you're preparing it, you've got to wait for it to dry before you can paint it. So you, you might, as a designer, suggest wet sanding is appropriate, and then when you start working with the contractor, the contractor would suggest that it might not be appropriate because he's thinking about productivity and you're thinking about and health, and you're thinking about health. So what's next on your list? What have you got next? Needle gum, grit blasting. Yeah. I was going to go for on tool extract. Okay, so you've got a sander, electric sander, um, and you connect it to a vacuum cleaner. Vacuum cleaner has to have the right filter, HEPA filter. It sucks all the dust away, contains all the dust with the lead in it. Yeah. So wet sanding. And then I would go for needle gun. 
because when you're using the needle gun, you're, you're actually creating chips of paint rather than paint dust. There is some dust, but you're creating more chips than dust. So you, as, a, as a lesser respirable fraction, you'd still need to be wearing personal protective equipment uh, of some sort to prevent breathing it in, but needle gun does that. What's next? What are you going to go for? Okay, we've got grip blasting and uh, and shot blasting. Okay, I would choose um, the shot blasting over the grip blasting. Yeah. Two reasons for doing that. One is that the organisations, the, the companies that do the contracts that do shot blasting, tend to be professional companies that do shot blasting. So they've got all their systems set up. Whereas if you ask contractors to do grip blasting, they'd probably just go and hire the gun and the, and the compressor and buy some bags of sand. And, and they tend to be less professional. I speak from experience. We had a project in Liverpool where we had sand three streets up the road where they were grip blasting the building. And of course, we wouldn't do it with grit. Why wouldn't we do it with grit? Yeah, because grit, when you um, smash it against the building or the paint or whatever, it's going to give off silica. So we'd have to use the, uh, select the right material to do it with. We call it grit blasting, select the right material. Whereas your average Joe contractor would hire all the equipment and go and buy some bags of sand. So not, where they, not only were they creating uncontrolled clouds of, of lead dust, lead paint dust, but they were adding silica to it as well, just for good measure. Um, so I would tend to pick shop blasting over grip because of the nature of the contractors. And then lastly, uh, we've got burning it off. Why is burning last on the list? Yeah, so it, it, it's because it produces a fume rather than a dust. So with the dust, we the contractor control the breathing in with a, a simple mask, face fit tested. But once you create the fume, then you have to have the proper mask with the activated proper canisters that can deal with the... So again, you're moving, you're moving the control measure up a notch. So you're expecting more of the contractor by going to burning over, over um, blasting or creating a dust. Okay? And there are several court cases where contractors, large contractors, haven't managed the, the, um, the fume and they put people in hospital. So that's the general principles of prevention. It's a hierarchy of choices. We're required as designers to have that in our mind as we are going through the design process. Pulling out the general principles of prevention and trying to work every design choice through it just doesn't work. But as designers, and certainly as the principal designers, we should have that notion of what, what would be better, a better design from a, from a health perspective. Uh, and designers certainly should be thinking about that. But the, the principal designer should be supporting uh, that conversation. Yeah. Just want to talk about the contractors' roles. So uh, as designers, we make choices that affect the way that contractors work. Um, we then expect the contractors to manage health and safety on site. Yeah. Um, and as I say, quite often that conversation is uh, around, and I think that research from the HSE is around, contractors just found that too difficult to manage. So we made a decision about designers, was designers, about what designers should be able to, contractors should be able to manage, but they, they, they don't find that possible to do. Um, some research that was done with, uh, with contractors, they were given 15 uh, issues to consider, to rank them in, in terms of difficulty of managing them in their, in their businesses. Um, and machines or tools was the top. Okay. And given what we know about the 110-100 relationship, actually, you would think it was, it was health that you should have identified was difficult to manage. Lifting and moving musculoskeletal disorder certainly is a, a problem. Um, but we get to kind of chemical and biological is down here. So I think that's even more reason beholden upon us as, as designers to um, think about it in our design. This is a particularly poor site that I visited. Um, so you can see that the contractors are testing the use of personal protective equipment. Um, uh, and when I went onto site, in the dim over here, I saw everybody putting on their personal protective equipment. Because I turned up, they realized that maybe they should do something about it. But gen in their general day-to-day, -day, uh, they didn't think it was important. There's a trench here. Um, it's about uh, 1,200 deep. 
um, nicely protected by a piece of plywood without any edge protection. Yeah? And over to this side here, there's a backdrop manhole, which certainly is person-sized that somebody could fall down. It's about four metres deep, uh, unprotected. Huh? It's, this, is, this is a bit of stud work. This is going on the left. Um, it was, uh, I don't know. I think it was to keep the rain off some workers or something. Not that there was any rain because they work indoors. <laughs> it, was, it was inexplicable. The general darkness is a problem. <coughs> and if you, go to, excuse me, if you go to construction sites and you see that, you should raise it as an issue. One contractor said, yes, I know it's dark in that room, but there's, to me, uh, but there's nobody working in that room. And then a week later, I got a notification of accident because somebody had gone into the room and tripped over all the pile of rubbish that was in the room without any light. Okay, so uh, a bit a bit anoraki, um, but the the mixer, the the rim of the mixer, is broken, uh, which means the mixer should be condemned because when it's going around, there's a snag hazard. Um, Two hundred forty volt electricity, which we don't expect to see on construction sites. Um, but they needed 240 volts electricity because you only get a Breville so toast maker in 240 volts. Okay? This was their canteen area. Um, uh, the steps, again, a bit anoraki, but the steps are domestic class three steps rather than class one steps, which we expect to see on construction sites. Something's missing from the toilet, uh, the cistern. Um, so how you flush it, I, I don't know. Um, and, and no wash hand basin. I, actually, the wash, I've got a wash hand basin. Oops. Uh, it's here. Uh, but it doesn't hold much water. So that was a, a, a construction site I went on. So uh, hopefully you have the pleasure of working with contractors like Overbury and, and the big organised contractors. But sadly, too much of our work is done by contractors like this. And if we think, or oh, we can leave that in our design because the contractor's going to manage it, uh, the evidence is that that isn't, isn't the case. Okay? Um, I'm hoping that the bucket's not green because it's got unleaded fuel in it rather than leaded fuel. I'm hoping that it's kind of got some water. Okay? And that's, again, th these aren't staged photographs. Um, obviously, somebody w read somewhere about glue being good for fixing wounds and that. that yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't. So I come back to this inspection initiative. Uh, sites that employ fewer than 10 people which in reality is a large part of our industry. Yeah? Uh, but there are big contractors, they do employ a lot of people, but when you look at the workload across the industry, most of it's done by organisations that employ fewer than, than, than 10 people um, because there's just volumes and volumes of sites out there doing that and half of them failing to meet the standard. Yeah? Um, and an exa another example, solar radiation, we saw that there are quite a lot of um, references, 60 fatalities a, a year, 59% of construction workers report having sunburn at least once in the year. And the sunburn creates the, uh, the increased risk of getting uh, melanoma. Um, and we're just not very, very good at it. This, however, is for the contractor to manage. So dust on site, uh, there's nothing we can do about that as designers. Uh, that very much is for the contractor to manage. And uh, working in appropriate weather conditions is also for the contractors to manage. Yeah. We have to have a bit of humour, don't we? So we talked about so far as reasonably practicable. Designers have to eliminate risks so far as reasonably practicable. Where they can't reduce risks, they have to, uh, where they can't eliminate them, they have to reduce them so far as reasonably practicable. This is a concept that we've had in the Health and Safety Work Act since 1974, but actually we had it, we've had it around forever. It was a concept under the Factories Act. Yeah? So the law says, you have to do something, but you only have to do it so far as reasonably practicable. So we weigh the benefits of doing it against the costs of doing it, and the benefits in terms of risk reduction and the costs in terms of uh, actual financial cost uh, effort and what have you. And it's usually characterised by a set of scales. So we put the, the risk on one side of the, of the scales, and then we put the cost, the mind, money, time, effort, environmental impact, etc., on the other side, and the health and safety executive uh, have told us that to spend uh, a million pounds to prevent five staff suffering a bruised knee is obviously grossly disproportionate, but to spend a million pounds to prevent 150 being killed, people being killed in an explosion is obviously, obviously proportionate. 
So they define the concept at either end of the spectrum. What so far as reasonably practical means was actually decided in a court case in 1943. So we've had it around for a long time. Okay? Um, and I, I will refer you later on to, oops, sorry, uh, to the, uh, click it more, to the APS's design risk management guide, and they capture the same concept in terms of the actions to control the risks in one side and then the risks in the other side, and it's this balance of actions against risk. So we usually abbreviate it to SFARP, uh, so far as reasonably practicable, and there are two elements. Uh, the first question is, was there anything practicably that could have been done? And when I was doing my health and safety training, my tutor said, you know, this would involve phoning NASA, for example. I've got a problem. Uh, is there any way we can sort this problem out? Yeah. So um, I'm thinking about lifting something, um, and I'm using my experience, uh, and I'm thinking about what's practicable, yeah. um, and I'm thinking about one of these. Okay. It's a big crane. It's got a long reach, but actually it doesn't work for me. Okay. It's not gotten a long enough reach for my particular project. So I might say there's nothing practicable that could be done. They had that problem at Earl's Court, and if you've not seen this case study, then really I advise you to read it up. Uh, they had a problem at Earl's Court. They had to remove some 100-ton uh, beams that were spanning the underground lines, um, and they couldn't do it with, uh, with any crane that they could buy, so they designed and built their own crane takes 11 days to erect, um, and it has the lifting capacity at, at the radius that they were looking for. Okay? So that's changed what's practicable. If you thought this was practicable, okay, now since two years ago, this is practicable, yeah? because this is now the biggest crane in the world, a land-based crane in the world, and if you want to hire it, you can hire it. Okay? It's sitting in some containers in the Middle East somewhere in the desert, uh, just waiting for somebody to hire it. Yeah. No, it's fixed. It's fixed. The, this on the back here, the Kentledge, which is the bit that stops the crane overturning, um, uh, has to be static because it's so big. Yeah. And, the, and the crane moves around it. How do you keep up to date with what is practicable? You read your journals, you go to your CPD, um, and you discuss things with, with colleagues. Okay? So, so the first question is, was there anything that could have been done practicably? And then we get to the second question is, would it be reasonable to do it? And that's where we balance the risk against the cost. So firstly, is, is there something we could do? The second question is, would it be reasonable to do it? Now, the regulations, the CDM regulations, talk about so far as reasonably practicable. The guidance produced by the Health and Safety Executive, the reference on the guidance is L153. And if you've not got a copy of that, then you should have a copy. Uh, download it from your, uh, whatever your search engine is. You can get a free PDF download. In paragraph 83, it says, health and safety risks need to be considered alongside other factors that influence the design, such as cost, fitness for purpose, aesthetics, an environmental impact that is so far as reasonably practicable okay so it's uh, risk on one side and the the costs on the other side in the previous version of this uh, document the previous incarnation of it it went on to say cdm does not prescribe design outcomes it merely asks designers to reach reasoned professional decisions so i'm your principal designer and I ask the question about, could we put the plant room in the basement? And if the designer says no, that doesn't sound like a reasoned professional argument. If the designer says, yeah, no, we thought about that. We didn't have the space in the basement. We're going to have it on the roof, but we've got a parapet to protect people falling off the roof. That sounds like a reasoned professional argument. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a friend of mine who's the... Um, uh, CDM advisor to the RIBA, and we were talking about how we might communicate this concept as so far as reasonably practicable. And I was thinking about a mixing desk at the time. I don't know why. And, and so we have the mixing desk of design risk management. Uh, and the higher up the sliders are, the better the, the solution. But the sliders are linked. 
Yeah? So when you push some sliders up, other sliders come down. Uh, you can't have all the sliders at the top. And different members of the design team are playing with different sliders. So the cost consultant is playing with the cost slider. Yeah? Cost slider, trying to get the slider up to the top doesn't mean that it costs more, actually means it costs less, so it's better value. Uh, the architect would be thinking about the functionality and the aesthetic sliders. So the architect would be trying to push those sliders up to the top because that's what they're required to do. The sustainability consultant would be thinking about the environmental slider, trying to push it up. The principal designer will be thinking about the constructability, the maintainability, and the cleanability, and the safety and use sliders. So we're trying to push those up to the top. Uh, and then the architect would also be thinking about public safety. Yeah? And there are a number of other sliders that we haven't talked about. So the structural engineer, um, the mechanical electrical engineers, the fire engineer, et cetera, et cetera, would all have their own sliders, which they're trying to push up. Yeah? Um, and unfortunately, we do get some uh, strong characters in the design team who seem to just always want to push their sliders to the top. Um, if you get somebody who's balanced and understands design, they understand that, yes, whilst they need to push their sliders up, other members of the design team also need to push their sliders up, uh, and therefore we achieve a, a balance in the end of uh, health and safety, in our particular case, health and safety, alongside the other considerations. Yeah? Um, so here's an illustration. This is the Queen Mother's Gate. It's at Hyde Park. What do you think the most important consideration was when it was being designed? Aesthetics, Aesthetics yeah. Yeah, it had to look good. It commemorates the Queen Mother, okay? Um, and actually, it really doesn't matter how much it costs. Uh, aesthetics is the consideration, okay? Um, functionality, if it takes two police officers to open and close it every day, if it takes a team of six horses, so be it, okay? It's about aesthetics that's most important. So the sliders might look like this. Aesthetics is, is very high. Uh, cost, I mean, the value, you would measure the value here in, in the impact that it created against the cost of doing it. Um, so you might argue the value is high, but actually the cost doesn't matter if it costs a lot. It doesn't really matter if it's not particularly functional. The public safety, obviously, is very important. If we have to get a great big crane in to install it, um, then, then so be it. Yeah? So that's how the, the sliders might uh, look, look like that. Yeah? And to make this reasonable assessment implies that we're making a, a, an assessment of whatever it is against the, the risk, against the sacrifice that we'd have to make to deliver that. Okay? And we need to keep uh, in proportion, and if it's shown that there's a gross disproportion, then uh, the courts might argue that we haven't done what we were supposed to do. And just as I showed you earlier, we get this uh, decay of opportunity and increase of cost. It's the same at the beginning when risk is high, we haven't defined anything. It's quite cheap, uh, cheap both in cost terms, but also in, in, in other terms to reduce the risk. But as we get through, um, it becomes more and more expensive um, to reduce the risk. And at some point, we achieve this balance where we've got to the point where we've done the design uh, and we've made our choices so far as reasonably practicable. And that point is called as low as reasonably practicable. Huh? Um, and, and it's where we've got that balance. Now, sometimes people talk about acceptability. So I, I pinched this from the Portuguese um, uh, website. And they talk about the ALARP region. But here they talk about tolerability. And tolerability is different from so far as reasonably practicable. Um, I met a guy who he'd had seven vertebrae removed and his target was to walk a mile a day. And so this piece of ground here, and certainly moving here, would have been intolerable. Ironically, the week later I met some free climbers and they said that the use of ropes, the mandated use of ropes, was intolerable. So tolerability is about your risk appetite and so far as reasonably practicable isn't about your risk appetite. It's about balancing uh, risk against the other cost factors. This is the Atomium. The Atomium was built for the World's Fair in Brussels uh, in, the, in the late 50s. Uh, it's quite an iconic structure. It, it's quite big. It's not quite that big. That's um, 
as a model village down there. But it is big, okay? It, it's quite a big structure and it was falling into de decay. Yeah? And if you wanted the least risk solution, you would just build a fence around it 200 meters away from it and let it slowly fall apart. Okay? Uh, if you wanted a bit higher risk, then you would um, demolish it. You know, demolishing it isn't risk free. Uh, in my opinion, uh, that would have been the wrong thing to do. I think it's a, it's a great structure. You might li like it. I, I think it's great. And so what they decided to do was refurbish it. And they recognized that in overcladding the spheres, um, they, they might have to clean it. And so they've built into the spheres uh, the hatches at the top so you can get out. But around the hatches, they built some hard points so that the abseilers can fix off their ropes. Yeah? So if you want an interesting job, you could get the job of polishing the spheres on the atomium. Yeah? I don't think it's a job I would like. Yeah? And in the top upper sphere, they've got some viewing windows, unsurprisingly. Uh, and you can see this one's cracked. If it had been designed so that it had to be reglazed from the outside, I don't think that would have been a good design choice. Um, but it was glazed, so it was designed so it could be reglazed from the inside. So, so far as reasonably practical is the balance of risk against cost, aesthetics, functionality, environmental impact, etc. And different members of the design team are doing different things. The principal designer is playing with the risk sliders and, and trying to get the risk to the lowest level. Yeah? But health and safety is not in an ivory tower. It's weighed alongside the other considerations. We have two approaches to health and safety. Historically, we've had a prescriptive approach to health and safety. The law told us what we had to do. Um, and we realized that actually that wasn't the best way of going about it. And the law has now changed to a goal setting approach. So here's an example. Uh, historically, with work at height, the law said that we had to protect people from falling if they were working over two meters. Now this guy here, this chap, is working at 1.9 meters. So for the prescriptive legislation, that's perfectly okay, meeting legislative requirements. Yeah. Goal setting, we've now defined work at height in a different way. We've defined work at height not as over two meters, but work at any height where if you fell, you would suffer personal injury. Yeah. So is this chap working at height? Yes. And therefore the law requires us to do something about it. Yeah. The law doesn't tell us what we have to do. The law tells us that we have to do something. And that something is about the person's health and safety. Uh, and in the smaller part of the industry, um, we find that contractors, small contractors don't like that. They want to know what to do and, uh, and not that they should achieve this goal of not harming people. Now, if you went onto a construction site to review the quality of the work, maybe you designed and you saw this, what would you do? Certainly one thing you wouldn't do is shout at the construction worker because as they turned around they would fall off the platform. Yeah. Hopefully you'd be accompanied by the site manager and hopefully before you'd said anything the site manager would say mm, I know it's not right is it? Okay. In which case why did you need to be there? Yeah. Obviously you need to be thinking about your own personal health and safety um, not to be falling into the, uh, the excavation but you should raise the issue with the site manager. Yeah. The law doesn't require us as designers to manage health and safety. That's the contractor's responsibility. Yeah. Depending on the seriousness, you might choose to take immediate action. In this particular case, I would take immediate action. So I'd walk around the other side. I'd get into the guy's line of vision, get him to look up, not all of a sudden, but look up and engage with him and talk to him and ask him to come down off his platform. And then we'd have a conversation with the site manager. When I go to site, uh, even if I'm doing site health and safety inspections, I like to be accompanied by the site manager. Okay? A, because he or she knows what the risks are and will tell you and keep you out of harm's way. But also you can bring these things to their attention. You know, rather than taking a photograph and going back into the office and having a conversation, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's useful to have the site manager with you. Yeah. Um, any questions about so far as reasonably practicable? 
No. Okay, I just wanted to mention BIM, um, BIM building information modeling. Um, certainly we're doing some work, Margaret was on one of the committees, we're doing BIM for health and safety. So we've developed some protocols, the industry's developed some protocols about how we might use BIM to communicate health and safety, immediate risks and, and the after risks in terms of the health and safety file. Uh, it's got quite a lot of, of use in terms of 3D visualization and some contracts are taking it up to use it for health and safety in terms of embedding health and safety information in the model, but it's a slow burn at the moment. But certainly it's, it's reaping big benefits in terms of communicating uh, work sequences, clash detection and things like that on projects. Okay? In the guidance L153, talking about the health and safety file, which is going to persist after the job is finished, the health and safety executive are encouraging the use of BIM to embed the health and safety information into the BIM model. Okay. Any questions? No? Okay, let's have a tea break. And uh, what's the time now? Should we start again at half past ten?
Okay, thank you. Welcome back, uh, everybody. So, in that first session, we've looked at the challenges that we face in the industry and the structure around which we do uh, can do things. What I want to do in this session is look at the so what. So, in all that, what can we do as designers in terms of uh, el eliminating ill health through design? So, in terms of the current construction phase, the work that's going to result from the design we're doing at the moment, as opposed to the work that was going to take place after practical completion, I want to look at uh, these elements. The role of the pre-construction information, what we might do about site layout, uh, existing asbestos and man-made mineral fibres, silica, solar radiation, manual handling, hand-on vibration, cosh noise and welfare. Hopefully there's no surprise because those are the issues we've identified in the first session that are challenging the industry, so what can we do about it? So pre-construction information, pre-construction information is provided by the client, managed by the principal designer, and it provides information about risk. Uh, risk that we need to consider in the design team in terms of the selections, the choices we make, but also maybe risk that the contractor might have to manage later on. So for example, the asbestos survey, contaminated land, things that we would have to, to manage in the design. So this is a project we were working on in Bedford. It was a small primary school and we were doing a, a new classroom on the front there and a new classroom on the back. Um, and the contractor, I was supporting the contractor, uh, the contractor said the intention was the, the, the classroom was um, steel framed, uh, both classrooms steel framed. He's going to get a little crane in there uh, and lift the steel frame into position, the steel elements into position. Uh, and on my way onto the site, I'd noticed there'd been some logistical challenges that would appear that didn't appear that the designers had thought about. So as you approached the, the road where the site was, you came over this bridge which was narrowed. So luckily it didn't have a weight restriction on it, so that was, that was good, although it was narrow, it was single file traffic. But to get to that bridge, you had to go under the canal, which was a, a very small uh, arch bridge. Um, and then you also had to go under the railway line. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge. And the crane, the size that was needed to lift the steel members into place, couldn't approach the site from the north. So we went down to the south of the site to, to have a look. Uh, and thankfully, the bridge, uh, which takes the railway line over the road, is much bigger, so we can get the crane through that. So sigh of relief, uh, drive up the road, and then you see the bridge that takes the canal over the, uh, the road, and similar restrictions. So the upshot of it was that the designers hadn't thought about it. You couldn't get a crane onto site that was big enough to lift the steel members into position for the back classroom. And the consequence of that was that the crane, they got in the biggest crane they could, it lifted the steel members about halfway down the back of the school, and then they tried to use a forklift truck, but because of the, the nature of the steel members, they couldn't do that. They could do it for the block work, but not for the, for the steel members. And so the people ended up carrying the steel frame around to the back of the building. Yeah. So through the design choices that had been made, it resulted in significant manual handling implications for construction workers. If the design of the school had been load-bearing masonry, then the manual handling implications would have been reduced because the blocks and bricks could have been loaded around to the back of the building by forklift truck and then laid. So, so fundamentally, the design choice, the frame choice, uh, was detrimental to the manual handling the, the backs uh, of the people. Yeah. Um, this is the, uh, the toll booth, the toll plaza on the, one of the Irish uh, motorways. Um, and we can see that we've presented uh, health implications for the people working there in terms of there's a little dish on the side of the building which gives off uh, microwaves so the communication system and so we need to be aware of that in terms of we're coming along later on to do some choices uh, same idea different building this is one of the buildings at imperial college we were replacing the, con the chp engines uh, in the basement the heat rejection plant was on the roof uh, and when we went up to have a look at the, the roof, we can see all these, um, these dishes which are using microwaves to send messages 
around and you can see this one's got a, a hazard warning on the back. Fortunately, that was pointing away from the building the where we were working uh, and the heat rejection plant which we were replacing uh, with a new heat rejection plant, uh, people weren't in the way of the microwaves. Uh, here's a seemingly uh, innocuous building. Uh, when you look more closely at it, you can see the uh, mobile uh, telephone antenna in, in white there, but actually underneath it, there's another antenna which has been cunningly placed, painted to look like the bricks. Uh, um, and there's uh, electromagnetic radiation being given off from those, um, and we need to consider those in terms of design choices. Um, again, this, is, this was a hospital, but we had a, a, an issue in university. So the height of the chimney is determined by dispersion. So we're stuffing stuff up the chimney, uh, products of combustion. The chimney height is determined by getting, by the time it comes back to the ground, it's mixed with air, um, and therefore the concentrations are sufficiently dilute. Um, and now we ask people to work on the roof and they're working in an area where the, the dilution hasn't occurred and we need to be thinking about that in terms of our design. What's coming out of that chimney, I don't know, but I'd rather not be downstream of it. The regulations have changed slightly, the 2015 regulations have changed slightly and they've introduced these um, specified risks in, in Schedule 3 and one of them is activities that require health surveillance. And that moves the burden upon us as designers to think about, are we uh, creating activities in our design choices that require health surveillance? Because if we do, we need to provide information in the pre-construction information so that we can provide it to the contractor. Layout of the site, this is a, a project in the Midlands, this little uh, triangular site um, bounded on the west by the railway line and on the east by the canal. And looking at the site, um, the vistas over the, to the east at the southern end of the, the site actually are quite appealing. A little bit of woodland, you're looking over the canal, very, very nice. We'll put some nice expensive houses down there. Huh? It turns out that that part of the site is contaminated. And so from a designer's choice, you wouldn't want to build on that part of the site because no matter what your design solution, uh, the contractor would have to bring contaminated soil to the surface and then people would be exposed to the contamination and, th and then they'd have to, to manage it. So actually the designers had chosen to put the housing on the clean part of the site and then the public open space, obviously they capped the contaminated ground so that people weren't exposed to it and then they put the public over open space over the contaminated ground. So really good design choices that were made. Asbestos we know is a killer, uh, man-made mineral fibres, um, some of the older fibres are also carcinogenic. So asbestos can, can crops up all over the place, um, despite the fact that it's uh, been banned since 2000. We're still seeing about 5,500 people being killed every year from asbestos-related diseases, partly due to the latency. And in the construction industry, mesothelioma, which is one of the three um, killer diseases, accounts for the death of 20 tradespeople every week. Okay. So, and, and the materials are there and asbestos awareness courses are available and you can make yourself uh, familiar with what you need to know as a designer. The, the regulations now mandate training, asbestos awareness training for designers. It's a half day course. So this is uh, Oxford Brooks University. Um, and down by the right hand side of the door there, there's this little label which says that underneath the floor tiles, uh, are um, asbestos containing vinyl floor tiles. In terms of designer choices, this is a, a building here with the doors and uh, as part of the building refurbishment they wanted to put in uh, card readers for security purposes and you can see on the left hand side of the door the card reader here on is flush mounted. Uh, looks very neat, very tidy and that's the, the finish we'd like to achieve. On the right hand side of the door however the material is an asbestos container material. So functionally, we have to have the proximity card reader in that position for the door. But if we insisted that it was flush mounted, we're creating a necessity for the contractor to cut into the asbestos container materials. The designers have recognized that and they've put a surface mounted reader on and they've put the cabling surface mounted as well. 
they've made that choice between the aesthetics of having a flush mounted reader and the health and safety risks of breaking into the asbestos containing materials and they've chosen to have it have it surface mounted in terms of uh, the HSE's work then there's a requirement uh, for mandatory training for designers um, you'll hopefully be familiar with the prosecution of Marks and Spencers where they've kind of got that balance of productivity against asbestos management uh, wrong I think it was a 1.2 million pound fine and the information about the training is there uh, which you can find man-made mineral fibers what we might call rock wool but rock wool isn't carcinogenic but man-made mineral fibers uh, made before 1985 were a class one carcinogen uh, made between 1995 and 2000 uh, were a class two carcinogen and post 2000 uh, they're not carcinogenic but if we're going into a building to open up an existing building we need to get that information because that will affect our design choices. If we've got um, the carcinogenic material in there, we wouldn't want to uh, make design choices that cause the contractor to have to, to work on it or cut into it. And for your reference later on, the, the carcinogenic categories are given there. Silica dust, um, the HSE have got some resources on their website. You thought Elvis was dead, but Elvis is on the HSE's website. Um, Elvis is their scheme for uh, talking about managing uh, silica dust. They've got some really good videos on there that talk about it. Yeah? So the problem with the dust is the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung cancer and silicosis are the three diseases and it's the respirable crystalline silica that causes the diseases. And with these substances, we have a thing called a well, a workplace exposure limit, and it's the amount of dust it's acceptable legally for a worker to breathe in over an eight-hour shift the the, the long-term well is over the full working shift yeah? the the target with all of these substances is to is to give them as little as possible to breathe into um, but there's an acceptable limit and the well if you piled up the well for silica the amount of dust it's okay for a construction worker to breathe in over an eight-hour shift it would look like that little gray dot there on the right hand side of that penny piece. And I was talking to a friend of mine who was an occupational hygienist and he said to me, he said, so what, what does the well for silica look like, Philip? And I said, well, it's that little, it's that little gray dot next to the penny piece. He said, um, he said, no, Philip, what does the well for silica look like? And I said, it's that, you know, the penny piece picture with the little gray dot by it? It's the little gray dot. He said, no, Philip, what does the well look like? And I said, um, clearly I don't understand the question. He said, the well looks like this. So when you spread that amount of dust into the air over an eight-hour shift, it's not visible. He also pointed out that the well for arsenic is the same as the well for silica. Huh? So you can breathe in as much silica over a day as you could breathe in arsenic. What's the difference between arsenic and silica? Arsenic is a quick death. Silica is a slow death. It's the same amount of material. So too often we see this. And um, I've not, actually, I've not seen any in Tottenham Court Road because I think they're pretty good at the way they manage it. So we would expect the contractor to manage the dust that's produced by using on-tool water suppression. But too often we see that the contractor doesn't manage the dust. Usually it's small contractors, but it's not exclusively small contractors. Quite often we see this with big contractors. So we've made an assumption in our design. It's okay to cut materials that produce silica dust because the contractor can manage the dust. But the evidence is we see that contractors don't manage the dust uh, for one reason or another. And here's an example. They could manage the dust. I have a fundamental question I think that's probably driven by my age is why are we cutting the paving stones into the radius curb? You know, when I was working in design 30 years ago, we'd have done the paving slabs, but that quadrant section would have been made in crimped asphalt or crimped concrete because it's a, it's a flexible material that can just form to whatever shape you want it to be. But now we seem to be obsessed with um, uh, cutting things to, to size. Uh, and I've got some photographs. We, we could see them maybe later. I was in Nantes the other weekend uh, at, at a meeting and the paving, they use the paving and then they make up the, the irregular bits. Instead of cutting the paving to size, they make it up with concrete. 
because it's, um, it's a flexible material, can be cut to size. Yeah. So here's the design choice. Some designer has decided that the linear drain on the left-hand side picture there has to go there. And it doesn't modulate with the paving. Now, that designer might not be an architect, might not be a civil engineer as we recognise them. They actually might be the groundworks contractor, uh, but they're making design choices. And they've decided that the linear paving needs to go there. It doesn't modulate with the paving. As a consequence, there are 300 metres of paving to cut. Now, it might be that the contractor cut those safely and managed the risk, but the design choice means that the contractor had to manage the risk. Whereas if the paving had, if the drainage had modulated with the paving, as we can see on the right-hand side, there was no need to cut the paving. So you've eliminated the risk of silica dust by modulating the drainage with the paving. Hmm? Um, here's another couple of examples. Um, I'm not saying I'm liking the picture on the left-hand side, but the use of the blocks with the pools paving slabs, the blocks uh, had to be snapped but not cut. That means that uh, we don't have to cut the paving slabs. The one on the right-hand side, there must be some aesthetic appeal in it, I guess, because there's masses and masses of cutting required. Um, here again, the movement joint in the building has not been modulated with the brickwork, and therefore... Uh, every course, one side or other of the movement joint, we get a brick that has to be cut. And this is the Source We Hock building, London School of Economics in Southampton Row. Uh, if you've not seen it, you should go and see it. There aren't many right angles on it, but the design team have thought about it, and they've designed it in such a way that to achieve that building, not a single brick had to be cut. It would have cost more in terms of the materials procurement. It would have cost more in terms of the, the bricklaying and the logistics and what have you. But the health cost has been dealt with by the fact that the bricks didn't have to be cut. Yeah? And, and that idea about what does the well look like, you can see the dust in, in this room. Yeah? Now, you, this is a garden wall on a development that we're building in, in Corby. We're providing the health and safety support. And you could argue that the finish on this corner of this garden wall uh, is just the contractor being lazy. Or you could say that actually designing it this way, it was probably the bricklayer who designed it, designing it this way eliminates the need to cut the masonry and has massive health benefits. Yeah. Sadly, some people have described this as robber bond. Building a ladder into the outside of your garden wall doesn't seem to enhance security. Uh, but there you are. So here's a fundamental question, the tree pit. Uh, the tree pit grating is going to go in around the tree pit. Should we have the round grating or the square grating? And you'll make an aesthetic choice. Uh, I don't think the one on the right looks particularly nice. Yeah? But you can put the paving in the square, or the one on the right, without having to cut any paving. Whereas with the round tree pit grating, every single block that touches the grating has to be cut. And the cuts are so small that they couldn't be snapped. So snapping a block is an option that doesn't create the dust, uh, but they all had to, be, had to be cut. And if you want your round and modulating, then just buy a different grating. Uh, again, this is that hotel where I showed you the movement joint of the brickwork. The up lighters that light the back of the hotel that nobody can see haven't been modulated with the block paving. And so all the block paving has to be cut um, all down the back. Yeah. And silica is in all materials. Ironically, there's more silica in the man-made materials than there is in the natural materials. But all of the materials we use in the construction industry, if you cut them, they will produce silica. So again, a choice. Are we going to chase out the brickwork and let the services into the brickwork and render in plaster so we have nice smooth walls? Or are we going to put plasterboard on dabs on the right-hand side there with the services behind the plasterboard on dabs? It's a simple design choice. And hopefully, if I haven't got you quite there yet, we will soon get you there, you go for plasterboard on dabs. Because chasing out the brickwork creates noise, dust, and vibration. As a structure engineer, brickwork, what brickwork? There's not much of it left. But if I tell you that this is an institutional building, um, secure accommodation or something like that, it changes your design choice. Because if you choose plasterboard on dabs, 
you'll find that within the first week somebody's put their foot through the wall and we're back repairing it and it's a it's a source of trouble and so you would go for a different design solution this is a refurbishment you would actually have to recess your services render them and plaster them so there isn't one right answer the answer is contextual upon the design choices yes it is possible for the contractor to manage the dust associated with chasing the services but you can see that by the amount of kit that's involved uh, it's not a simple task it can be done but it but it's not simple yeah. this is on the city road uh, here in here in London and they're finishing off the stonework uh, and they're working off a scaffold tower and then when you look a bit closer you can see they've got a vacuum so they're finishing up the, the stonework and they're using the on-tool extraction which which is good yeah. um, loading this steel beam in luckily at this stage it can be mechanically handled but what happens when it gets halfway into the building it tips over and now it becomes to become manually handled we can shorten the sections of steel by creating bolted connections but again there's a choice there between are we going to use regular bolts or high strength friction grip bolts because the high strength friction grip bolts putting them in creates vibration and noise are we going to have lots of bolts with a splice this looks quite complicated uh, but if it gives you a smaller section it's probably advantageous or are we going to weld it on site the welding flume fume is carcinogenic so you, re you reduce the weight but you increase the property yeah uh, lots of design choices have to be made you have to make an informed decision we want to make a hole in a wall would we put a man with a jackhammer or a woman with a jackhammer would we have a, a, a an excavator with a point on the end uh, chomping away at it or would we use a, a wall saw we'll, ignore the way the guy's standing on the ladder you know you can't always get the perfect photograph um, the wall saw is expensive but it doesn't create any vibration it doesn't create any dust and creates less noise and it'll be faster overall than having a JCB sitting there with a point smashing away at the structure and then the structure engineer won't be happy either so they're all design choices uh, that we have to make when you come back to the notes later on there are lots of ways that designers can make design choices that eliminate dust solar radiation I asked the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health got this campaign called no time to lose they're looking at uh, four of the uh, carcinogens uh, uh, causing deaths at, at work and one of the cases was solar radiation um, the statistics suggest that we're five times more likely to get melanoma in this country than in Australia and when you think about the amounts of sun like in this country compared with Australia that seems a bit strange but it's about our attitude in Australia when the Sun comes out they put a hat on and cover up their necks and put on some cream in this country when the Sun comes out we just take our clothes off certainly in the construction industry they try to yeah? um, and that exposes them to solar radiation oh. and, and essentially tanning is burning of the skin uh, this is uh, apparently your archetypal British construction worker on holiday He's had the decency to keep long trousers on, but he's taken his shirt off. Yeah? And this is a sun worshipper. This guy uh, was a, his American truck driver, and he drove around with his window open, so he wasn't protected from the solar radiation on one side. And they reckon that the skin on that side has aged 20 years more than the skin on the other side of his face. Okay? So solar radiation is, is a big issue. Yeah? And where might we think about it in terms of roofing selection? So we'll be thinking about a three-layer built-up felt, which is going to take three times as long as a single-layer felt torched on membrane. Yeah? Things to think about. Uh, a lot of our housing these days is one and a half story or two and a half story, which means we create roof rooms, which means we have to have dormers, uh, and we could have the dormers hand-built, um, hand-finished. Uh, contractor's not very bright here in terms of providing protection. Or we could have GRP dormers. They don't look as good as lead dormers. Um, I, ha I have to say, it's a, I don't think anybody's going to be looking at them. They're two and a half stories up. I don't think people go around looking at their dormers. Um, but there you are. So the choice, hand-built dormers, which I'm told look better yeah. than GRP dormers. So what's the difference? A hand-built dormer is two workers for a week. It's 10-person days of work. 
a GRP to a uh, two people for a day, two people a day of work. Right? So in terms of solar radiation exposure, that's the thing you have to take into account. You've got the aesthetic choice uh, against the, the health risk associated with it. And the same argument can be made for the preformed chimneys, and these are preformed porches um, to reduce the amount of work. Terrace of three houses, um, built within the last five years, and for some reason the ridge has stepped. And because the ridge has stepped, the roof has stepped, we have to put lead work down the joint to make sure that it, it doesn't leak, which is people working on roofs. And you might argue that's necessary because of the topography, because the site slopes. Right? This is the terrace next door. It's the same topography, but we've got a, le a level ridge. So it implies to me that the designers didn't think in 3D when they were thinking about the first terrace. They didn't think about the implications of, of that uh, external work. Manual handling. Uh, manual handling is the biggest cause of lost time in the construction industry. So we need to think about <clears throat> what are the manual handling implications of our design. If we're specifying curbs, sheet materials, blocks, uh, system scaffold, and, and other things. So 30% so of lost time due to manual handling. Um, it, it's a significant factor in our industry. And for some reason, we expect contractors to do this. So we specified a British standard curb there, um, and these contractors are laying it. They had about uh, 600 metres of curb to lay on the site, the two roads either side of the building and had two curbs either side. Um, reputable large contractor. The question is, were you expecting them to do this, to use a vacuum lifter to lift the curbs? If that was your expectation, why wasn't that was what was being delivered on site? So either we need to be more explicit about our expectations as designers, or we need to make different design choices. And these vacuum lifters come in, in different shapes and sizes, and, and they even work on heritage curbs. So that's uh, uh, Crossrail at Paddington uh, replacing the roads. Slip forming. A machine is just set up. You pull concrete in the top, you move it along, you've got the former set at the bottom, and as it goes along, it leaves behind it a curb, whether that's the concrete on the left or asphalt on the right. Slip forming doesn't require any manual handling because you mechanically handle all the plant. So there's a challenge for you. Do you want a British standard pre-cast curb or is slip forming acceptable? From a health perspective, uh, the slip forming is preferred to the, to the other because we find our experiences that people don't mechanically handle them. Could we use a plastic curb? You can see that these plastic curbs are very lightweight. The look is similar, it's different. Uh, it's a change of aesthetic from the precast curb, but it has the health benefits in terms of manual handling. Again, there are functional considerations. You wouldn't want to put this on a corner where a, a lorry might mount the corner, might mount the curb, because it would just crush the curb. But if it's a parking space in a retail park, for example, and it's head on parking, it would be perfectly adequate to use the plastic curb. And again, other curb choices, the beanie block comes in two pieces, it reduces the weight, um, and you've got the integral drainage channel in it. Yeah? And there's some research reference there for you if you want to look at, at curbs. Block paving. So here's a great machine uh, where you load the blocks on at the back, the guys are standing up so they're not bent over, um, which is a much better posture to be working in. They put the blocks on the top uh, and they come out at the bottom uh, in, as a complete road. Yeah. But it has design implications. If you had a manhole in the middle of the road, this wouldn't work. Um, if your road had tight radiuses on it, this wouldn't work. So you've got to make design choices that reflect the manual handling uh, issues as well as the other issues that you've got to achieve, the aesthetics, the functionality, what have you. Sheet materials, there's a conversation going on in the industry at the moment about whether we should be using full-size sheets or half-size sheets. Uh, plasterboard particularly, because of the volume of plasterboard we use. I was talking to one of the plasterboard manufacturers, and they make enough plasterboard in this country uh, every hour to plasterboard a four-bedroomed house. Right? 
So we're using masses and masses of plasterboard. Uh, and a little study was done, um, various people involved, clients, uh, installers, the health and safety executive, uh, some of the big contractors. And they wired a, a plasterboard, some plasterboard um, fixes up uh, electronically to find out what was happening with their muscles. Um, and they gave them full-size sheets and half-size sheets, or, or 1,200 wide sheets as the, uh, the brown columns, or 900 wide sheets is the green column. And they found that in terms of muscle strain on the back, there was no difference between the, size, the two sizes of sheets that we used. In terms of... Um, uh, sorry, what's the next column? In terms of the left shoulder, there was a slight reduction in muscle strain when the 900 wide boards were used. But in terms of the, the collarbones, the right shoulder here, where the, where the most harm was done, the 900 wide sheets gave us a 30% reduction. Um, we also found, the research also found, that the 900 wide sheets, although you've got less square meterage of, of plasterboard per sheet, the productivity went up significantly. Yeah. Uh, and it was also found that waste was reduced. Yeah. So, question you need to ask yourself is what role do you play in terms of uh, selection of plasterboard? Is it that the designers mandate the size of the plasterboard or do we just talk about the specification, the finish we're trying to achieve, and we leave it to the contractor to select the right plasterboard sh size sheet for their work? Well, there was a project where uh, a residential building was being converted into an old people's home. And they wanted to increase the sound resistance of the dividing walls. Um, and they were following uh, Part E of the regulations, the passage of sound. Um, and the design team specified 15 millimeter sound block boards. The health and safety executive went to site and they discovered that these boards uh, were being, or full size boards, were being manually handled by one person. And they weighed 34 kilograms, which is way, way above what anybody should be expected to carry. So they spoke to the contractor and asked why this was happening, why they were being uh, handled by one person, why they weren't using mechanical means, trolleys, etc., to handle them. Uh, but they went back to the design team and the principal designer and asked the principal designer and the design team what they had done in terms of guiding the selection of materials in terms of the manual handling implications of it. Okay? Uh, in residential work, in, uh, in modern housing, we invariably take the plasterboard, the contractor invariably takes the plasterboard upstairs after he's put the first floor in, and some of the contractors have come up with this little uh, letterbox where they cut out a section of floor. Obviously, they hinge it and put it back so you can't fall through the floor. But instead of having to carry the plasterboard upstairs, they actually just post them through the letterbox. Uh, and there's even a little device you can add to your ladder so you can uh, handle it uh, individually. Although that would be, or push it up individually, would be above your weight capacity. And we see it on every street corner, full-size sheets of plasterboard uh, being manually handled. In terms of blocks, uh, there's some guidance that the HSC have provided um, in terms of the lifting capacity of the typical worker, but the health and safety executive have said that designers shouldn't specify blocks that weigh more than 20 kilos. And, and there are various reasons for that. The, the height at which the blocks are laid, the postures of the individual, the fact that, excuse me, when they're handling blocks they have to twist, uh, and that there are a lot of alternatives. Neil Vesma was an architect. He specified blocks that weighed 38 kilos um, and he was prosecuted by the health and safety executive successfully and they fined him because they didn't think he'd thought about the manual handling implications associated with the block work. So whilst the guide load for a dense compact load of the core of the body might be 25 kilos, the guide capacity for this individual would be 10 kilos. Uh, and for these, where they're bent over, it would be 10 kilos, and when they're working at a foot level, it would be 5 kilos. So specifying a block that weighs more than 20 kilos, you're putting the, them under, under strain, and every time they pick up a block, they move their back. It's said that if you ask a taxi driver what they used to do before they were a taxi driver, one in three of them would tell you that they used to be a block layer, and they've invalided themselves out of the industry because their backs are too bad. So, on the one hand, we know it's bad for you, and you might be thinking, well, so what, what else could we do? Well, 
the reason the HSC are so um, sure about the 20 kilo limit is because there are a number of options. So on the left hand side here we see a midi block, a block that's only two brick courses high, it reduces the weight. On the right hand side you could use a hollow block, um, whether you chose to fill the course or not, but depending on what the structural performance you were looking for. Uh, you could use a twin skin wall to achieve dense thick masonry, or you could lay the block flat on its side. So lots of options, lots of choices that designers could make if they want dense thick masonry without specifying blocks that weigh more than 20 kilos. And we have to ask ourselves the same question about beam and block floor. Beam and block floor very prevalent, uh, especially in the, the house building market. Um, that individual's capacity, set aside the risk of him falling down below the floor, his individual lifting capacity is about seven kilos in that position, and those blocks weigh about seven kilos. But at the top we can see, and, and around the sides, there are a number of polystyrene options that create the same effect. You, you might have to change the, the screed specification slightly. Uh, they add some thermal insulation, but of course they weigh dramatically less than the, than the uh, traditional block. In terms of paving, uh, the HSC are encouraging contractors to use a slab lifter. It doesn't increase, doesn't decrease the overall weight, it just changes their posture, um, and they do exist in reality. I've seen them, that was Exeter High Street. Yeah. But again, designers should be thinking about, do we need the paving that big, that thick, so it ends up that heavy? Um, have we told the contractor about it? And of course, team lifting is always a good idea. Here. We're moving to more system scaffold in this country rather than tube and fitting. In mainland Europe, system scaffold is, is the thing that they use. They tend not to use tube and fitting at all. Some research has showed that whilst uh, tube and fitting scaffold has its own uh, problems in terms of the 21 foot tubes, the weight of the 21 foot tubes, and some contractors have stopped using the 21 foot tubes. System scaffold also has its problems because of the highly repetitive nature of the work that's being done and, and therefore there's a choice uh, decision to be made there. In terms of other things, again this is just a, a typical uh, a building in a, a window in a domestic residential property. The sill, do we, are we interested in how much the sill weighs? Well that depends on how we think the sill is going to be handled. Are we going to mechanically handle it or are we going to manually handle it? And experience would say that the contractors tend to manually handle it. And the designers recognise this. And they specify the sill in two pieces so that it's lighter and it can be more easily manual handled. The lintel, however, is a different matter. So habitually, usually, how do we handle lintels? We tend to use mechanical means to do that. They're uh, delivered to site by mechanical means and then they're hoisted into position uh, with something like a genie hoist. And therefore the weight isn't such a consideration because habitually we use mechanical means to lift the material. The metal work outside the full height doors, uh, the Juliet balconies, um, do we care how much the metal work weighs? Again, it's a question of understanding about how it's going to be fixed. Is it going to be fixed whilst the scaffold's in place, so it's going to be loaded onto the scaffold and people are going to have to carry it along the scaffold, which is manual handling, which we need to be concerned about the weight, or are we going to strip the scaffold and hoist it into place with a machine and then fix it off, in which case the weight isn't such a concern. So we need to understand the construction processes. Unfortunately, with uh, cellular offices made in existing buildings with large glass panels, there is only one construction process. Um, and if we're going to go for full height, uh, wide panels, they're, they're going to be heavy. And the HSC is encouraging us as designers to think about other design solutions which are less heavy, because usually the access to those points isn't particularly good, especially if they're retrofitted. If, a, as part of a refurbishment project, we create this cellular office space with, um, with glazing. Uh, again, a question of uh, manual handling on site. Uh, five people around this piece of plant having to manually handle it uh, and the questions about why that is. And for your reference, some, some typical weights and materials. Okay? So manual handling, uh, biggest cause of lost time in the construction industry. Hand-on vibration syndrome, 
uh, results in, uh, usually results in, quite often results in vibration white finger, but can result in tennis elbow, RSI, and carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and it's these kind of operations. So um, the structural engineer has specified that the joint, the day work joint, be created, be prepared by using scabbling, um, creates the, the, vo the vibration, the noise, and the silica dust as it happens, uh, which are very bad for people. Could that be achieved in some other way? Again, if we're looking at architectural concrete, uh, are we exposing the aggregate by using similar means? Could it be done some other way? Because the risk with the vibration is the vibration white finger, where the nerves in the fingers uh, die and you get a lack of blood supply uh, and it becomes very difficult to use the fingers and then ultimately uh, it can result in gangrene because of the, the lack of blood supply to the fingers. Uh, pile cutting down piles if we don't think about it the contractor ends up uh, cutting the piles down uh, manually so this chap is being exposed to noise dust and vibration and his posture isn't very good either because he's having to hold that breaker on a on a pile top that becomes more and more conical the more and more he works on it alternatively we could specify debonding of the rebar that's just simple uh, pipe insulation that's put over the top of the rebar uh, as is shown on the left hand side there in the pink and then once the pile is poured a crack is induced at cutoff level in the pile um, and the piece of concrete comes off it's just poured off the top there's no um, uh, breaking need to be done it leaves a nice clean finish um, and you end up with a piece of aggregate that's that's easy to to use and, and those breakers uh, machine mounted alternatively if it's a pile that's too big to get a breaker on uh, the, the cut could be induced by high pressure water jetting. Lots of options, lots of things that designers could do. Cast in channels, we tend not to do cast in channels, I don't know why in this industry. Uh, if you don't put a cast in channel in, in your design, it means that the tradesman who's coming along later on to fix whether it be the, the, the pipe work, the drainage, the air supply, the cables, whatever, the cable tray, they all have to drill into the concrete. They're drilling overhead, it's noise, dust and vibration. Um, and of course, drilling overhead, there's a risk of getting materials in their eyes. All of those things can be managed. CDM is asking us, can we change our design so that those things don't have to be managed because we've eliminated the operation from site and casting in the channels would do that. Kosh Control of Substances Hazards to Health. We mentioned earlier about the, the painters and decorators. Um, and the HSC is saying that with the new paint formulations, um, there's not such a concern if we're using water-based paints rather than oil-based paints. Um, oil-based paints, if they have to be used, should be used externally. But we're still seeing these, these deaths. And, and it is in the general construction industry. So uh, ship painting, they use some quite interesting materials. Um, that's a euphemism for harmful, um, but they tend to be more professionally managed because it tends to be the specialists who are doing the works. It's, as I was talking earlier on about shot blasting and grip blasting, th these, these more harmful formulations tend to be used by more experienced contractors who set themselves up better, but it's the, it's the general painting and decorating that seems to be causing a challenge to us. Okay, so that's uh, cyclical maintenance on um, uh, ha uh, housing association owned property. So that leads us to, as designers, you know, which would we choose, oil-based or water-based? One has performance uh, improvements. The, the oil-based is a higher, better performing material. The water-based is less harmful. This is what CDM asks us to do, to make those choices. And if we think the contractor should just manage it, one of the things I've noticed recently is that the, uh, the health warning symbols for the paint which you'd expect to be on there haven't, have been removed uh, generally, unless this, this particular one happens to be flammable and this one is quite a nasty formulation. And, and that painting goes everywhere. So this guy is uh, he's painting lighthouses um, uh, and I think he puts as much paint on himself as he actually puts on the, the lighthouses uh, painting out in the, uh, in the, in the open air. The Aquatic Centre at the Olympic Park. The structural engineer had specified 
that a, a material be used hand applied on the steelwork in, in situ on site. When the contractor got to look at the material and started to do his cost assessment, he discovered that it was a toxic material that contained lead. It's very harmful. Luckily, it was picked up and the contractor changed the specification and the, the workers weren't exposed to, to uh, the fumes and the lead in the paint. Diesel engine exhaust emissions, as I said earlier, are uh, carcinogenic. Um, and, and again, it's the designers need to be thinking about how the job's going to be built out. Too often on projects, uh, the design team haven't thought about the electricity supply that's going to be needed to build the works. They think about the electricity supply that's going to be needed to run the building. Um, but because they haven't thought about the temporary supply, we find generators on site. This contractor, the generator that's running the cabins, has got the answer right because he's ducted away the, the fumes. But the fundamental question is, why is he having to do that? Why hadn't we as a design team thought about the power load that was required for the temporary setup and made provision as part of the design process so that that could be achieved? And the same goes for tower cranes. So we see that the tower crane uh, requires a high electrical supply. We tend not to think about it. We end up with a, a generator, and that generator is usually at the lowest level, which ends up being in the basement, which ends up being enclosed, and therefore everybody else is working in the basement, the pipe fitters, etc., uh, who have got their stores and what have you, and their workshops in the basement are exposed to elevated levels of diesel engine exhaust emissions. And something as simple as uh, this is a cleaner for cleaning UPVC. You know, if you're working in that part of the, the industry, you might be specifying this. Uh, it comes in a spray bottle. On the back of the spray bottle, it says, do not breathe the spray and avoid the contact with the skin and eyes. There are no hazard warning symbols, which there should be. But there's a fundamental question there about if it's harmful to breathe the spray, why would you put that material in a spray bottle? Why wouldn't you put it in a bottle where it was applied through a rag, for example. But if we're specifying it, we need to think about that. Resin bound and, and bonded surfaces, uh, a great finish, uh, very, very functional. But the resins are usually epoxies, and the, the accelerator part of the epoxy has a tendency to cause dermatitis, as does concrete. Um, and, and unfortunately, if there's no relief from it, if they don't invalid themselves out of the industry, the, ter the dermatitis just gets progressively worse and the only cure for it is to stop working in the industry. So concrete, two elements to concrete. One is the chromium which can cause the dermatitis and we've changed the concrete, we've reduced the amount of chromium, so we've done some work there. But it is a strong alkali. So here we see some guys laying concrete, uh, it's an operation that you see day in and day out. The question that we should be asking ourselves as designers is, could that be done in precast? Because if it's done in precast, it's done in the factory, it's done in factory control conditions, and a machine will do the finishing rather than people wading around in concrete. And we've had some, some bad cases where this, this chap tucked his trousers inside his boots which you might think was quite normal because you didn't want to get trousers dirty, but as a result, some concrete that fell on his boots went down inside his trousers, inside the boot, sorry, inside the boot, and it sat there for the shift, and the alkali burnt this hole in the side of his foot. This guy was kneeling down in pervious clothing. He wasn't wearing a waterproof clothing uh, all day, and the alkali burnt his knees, and this guy had to have his legs amputated uh, because of the cement burn from the alkali from laying concrete. We talked about welding flume, fume earlier on. Um, so we can see on the left-hand side here in a, in a workshop, it's relatively easy to control, a bit of local exhaust ventilation. But if we've designed, made a design choice for on-site welding, then how we think the contractor is going to deal with the fume? Right. So there are some instances where we have to, uh, but if we can avoid it, then we should do so. Right. And the same with um, copper pipe work. If we specified soldered fittings, the, 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 um, the flux for the solder gives off a fume that's harmful to health. Um, and we could specify crimped fittings instead. Uh, just as, in fact, they're, they're reported to be more reliable than the, the, the soldered fittings, uh, and they don't create any fumes. 
it is more becoming more and more prevalent. Designers are, are getting the, the story about it. Uh, it's, and it's faster and it's cheaper. Um, uh, but for some reason, we still seem to want uh, soldered pipe work. Dermatitis, we talked about uh, epoxies, so we need to be thinking about where are the epoxies, um, the materials that we're specifying. So simple things like a, a two-part wood hardener, if we're doing a refurbishment project, two-part wood hardener, one is an epoxy material, and the, the hardener part uh, has the potential to cause dermatitis. Electric magnetic radiation, uh, there's a square law comparing the power uh, to the distance. Uh, I was doing an inspection on this roof and I asked the, the guys, so what's this white thing? I, I think I knew what the answer was. Um, and it was a microwave dish, an old communications system that had been used in the borough uh, based on microwave. And you could see that it was absolutely at, at head height. And if it had been functioning, um, then they would have been getting doses of, uh, of microwaves. Their complaint was they kept hitting their heads on it which was actually a minor issue compared with the microwave. L luckily, it turned out that the inquiries hadn't been made by the design team beforehand. Luckily, it turned out that the system had been turned off uh, and there wasn't a microwave risk. Legionella, if that's, if that's your design discipline, we need to be thinking about Legionella. Um, it's not such an issue in the, in the design, although it can be an issue, uh, especially if we're doing refurbishment projects. So we were working in a, an old clinic where one of the uh, treatment rooms had been turned into an office um, and the wash hand basin had just been left there. Um, when you turn the tap on, if somebody had turned the tap on, the water would have splotted out. It would have created a, um, an aerosol. That aerosol would have been chock full of high levels of, of legion, uh, Legionella bacteria and then there was a risk from it. Okay, so we need to be thinking about how is the building going to be used that we're designing. Um, and if we think it's something straightforward, we see Legionella cases coming to court uh, probably every couple of months. This was a retailer who was selling hot tubs. He had three live displays, but he hadn't treated the water. Uh, and some members of the public who were coming to see the hot tubs and deciding about whether they'd buy it, um, breathed in the aerosol, which contained high levels of Legionella, uh, and there were three deaths resulting from it. So. It's not a well understood issue, although we do see uh, quite a significant number of cases coming to, to court. And then there are other things floating around. So if you're, if you're working with those kind of materials, this HAI scribe document is a really good document produced by NHS Scotland, which talks about their expectations. If you're working on healthcare facilities, uh, what the designers and the contractors should be doing in terms of designing out risks to vulnerable people who are working, uh, uh, being treated in those um, uh, environments. Uh, uh, Viles disease, we need to be thinking about in terms of, you know, in, in terms of our design. Psittacosis, uh, also known as pigeon fancies, lung. You know, if that's an issue in the building, then we need to encourage the client to spend the money to do the clean-up before the contractor comes along. And also thinking about uh, bird protection measures, the bird avoidance measures in our design solution. Yeah. Anthrax uh, has a high appreciation of, or high, people perceive there to be a high risk associated with that anth anthrax, and we're forever testing existing plasters for anthrax, but actually in terms of its prevalence, uh, we had one person who died uh, last century from anthrax, and he was using untanned skins to make drums. So uh, it has this this mystical... Uh, property where everybody talks about anthrax in the construction industry, but we find that there's not high prevalence. Uh, Viles disease, in terms of where are we working, uh, have we thought about that, have we raised it uh, as an issue? Again, it, it's everybody in the construction industry carrying a Viles disease card, but it tends to be um, uh, people who are engaging in sport on stagnant or, or still water that suffer more from Viles disease than construction workers. It, it's a real risk uh, that has to be thought about. So I saw this chap working on this ladder and um, I was a bit worried about the chap who was footing the ladder to stop it falling over uh, in terms of their ability to breathe. Um, but somebody's not thought that through. I think as the design team, 
we should have been talking about how is this work going to be executed and making sure there was enough money in the budget to do that. Um, in the end, the client's gone to cheapest price uh, and that's what he's got. What's the relationship between Vars disease is obviously has, having to come up the river, river bank uh, and work in the river. Probably okay with that water given the speed of the perceived speed of movement, but it's something that needs to be thought about. And, and similarly, Lyme's disease, this is ticks on, uh, 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 on deer that fall off and then bite people on the ankles, um, can be fatal, can be severely de um, debilitating, and we need as a design team to understand you know, whether that's an issue on the site that we're building on and what are we going to do about it. Uh, we've had a section of my, the town where I live which has been fenced off for four years to try and get rid of the ticks uh, that were um, tragically killing dogs and things that went into the area. Yeah. So we need to be thinking ahead of in terms of if we know, find out whether it's an issue and if we know it's an issue, do something about it in the preparatory stages so that it's not just left for the contractor to deal with when he gets to site. We talked about lead in paint earlier. This is your, your reference document, the British Coatings Foundation Federation document about lead in pipe uh, paint. Uh, we need to be thinking about the exposure. We need to be identifying whether it's there or not and then making design choices as we talked about in that earlier exercise earlier that um, reduce the risk of lead dust being produced because actually if you're going to produce the lead dust it's actually very difficult for the contractor to manage and so we might think about uh, our specification preparation specifications uh, that reduce the amount of, of dust um, or we might go completely the other way so We've had some projects where we wanted the doors were in particularly poor condition and we've actually said we're going to take those off site, have them dipped professionally to get the paint off uh, where all the lead's contained rather than uh, scratching them with sandpaper or something like that. Yeah. So we need to be thinking about that. Uh, very harmful. Uh, some of the paints that we used in the 60s, half of the content of the paint was lead. Um, uh, and the, we talked about the preparation specifications earlier, it, it's there. So uh, are the choices obvious? Uh, top left is red lead paint. It's got lead in it very, by its very nature, but it's in big flakes. Could we take the flakes off with a scraper? It's easier to avoid breathing them in because they're big flakes, um, and then paint on top. Or is the structure engineer going to insist on a particular finish that's going to create a lot of dust? Uh, bottom left, it's obvious we're going to have to take the paint off there. We're going to have to think about probably a chemical peel for that. The, the windows, we might deconstruct the windows and send them off and have them dipped, uh, depending on what the situation with the glazing. On the right-hand side there looks pretty innocuous. Uh, those are the, the windows in the house that we now live in, which was a Victorian school, which we're trying to make habitable. Um, when were the windows last painted? Probably in the 60s the surface layer of paint will contain lead. And so I did a bit of risk management there. I got my, I got my wife to sand them and said, no, that's not true. I sanded them myself uh, with obviously all the appropriate precautions on, on tool extract we used. Uh, we couldn't use um, chemical peel. Looking at this on the face of it, um, the guy in the pink t-shirt doesn't seem to have got the message about the, the health risks that the other guys have got. Um, on the other hand, we need to be careful that the three people in yellow, maybe they don't understand the risk and they're overreacting to it. Okay? So every picture tells a story, but the story is not necessarily the obvious one. Uh, and, and we see that time and time again in the construction industry. We need to have that informed process. Foundations, if we're working on a contaminated site, um, you know, what are the choices that we've got? Well, the first choice is don't build on this site. Now, it sounds, sounds like a stupid suggestion to make. We've got to put the building up for it. Well, does it have to be on this site? If the site's contaminated, because if we don't build on this site, we've avoided the risk of exposing workers to contaminated materials. It's the question we should ask. It's at the top of the general principles of prevention. 99 times out of 100, the answer will be yes. And then we move into some risk mitigation choices but if somebody's harmed digging in the ground it would be quite reasonable to ask the question of the design team why are we building on this site one of the awards we were judging uh, yesterday was a, a cancer um, research facility they've got contaminated ground 
Um, and what they decided to do was to do a suspended ground slab on driven piles so that they didn't have to dig into the ground. And because it was suspended, they could bring all the services again above the surface of the existing ground and so they didn't have to dig into it. So it's a simple design choice. The first choice was just to, we'll just do this because that's what we do on every other job. And then somebody asked the question about contamination and they changed the design so that they didn't have to dig into the ground. So, so lots, of, uh, lots of design options there. Noise, um, as I say, the construction industry now is the biggest uh, industry for noise-induced hearing loss. So we need to be thinking about what of our design choices create noise? So we mentioned earlier, it might not be your bag, structural steelwork, but bolted connections. Are we using normal bolts, uh, which are just tightened up? Or are we using high strength friction grip bolts where we have to tighten up with an impact wrench? The impact wrench creates um, vibration. And you'll notice when you're walking around the streets now that scaffolders are using impact wrenches rather than spanners. So on the one hand, they're reducing the amount of wrist movement that they used to have with spanners. On the other hand, they're increasing the amount of vibration and noise. Um, and, and there's a difficult, uh, difficult balance there. And we talked about casting channels earlier in terms of uh, reducing the amount of drilling and therefore the amount of noise. And, and as with dust, there's a list there of things you can look at later on in terms of mitigating noise. And last in this section, I want to talk about welfare. And you might be thinking, well, what do I need to think about welfare for as a designer? Because welfare is the contractor's decision. Um, and I would say very much not. Okay? The standard that's set for welfare is good enough to take your family into without being embarrassed. That was the previous chief inspector of construction articulated that. As design team, we need to think about where is the welfare going to be and how is the contractor going to be able to provide warm running water and flush toilets at the end of day one? Because that's what we'd expect, isn't it? We'd go onto a construction site, you'd expect to see warm running water and flush toilets. The standards that are set in CDM are the same as the standards that are set in the workplace regs. So the toilets here are built to the same specification standard, the quality of finishes is different, but it's the same requirements, functional requirements, as the so to toilets on construction sites. And we also need to be thinking about the electricity supply. Can we make the temporary builders uh, work order in advance and the drainage so that the contractor, as I say, at the end of day one, has got warm running water and flush toilets, and he's not got a generator, and he's not flushing the toilets into a tank that has to be pumped out. And the HSE are, are looking at their welfare standards again for transitory sites, but certainly for fixed sites, uh, they won't be being changed. And that's what you should expect to see. Okay? That's a construction site, uh, toilets, nice design, nice installation, kept tidy. There's a chap whose job was to clean it, and he spent all day cleaning it. And when you look at the three-pack hand care, that gives you a, a, an example of the contractor knows what he's doing. When I'm doing a site inspection, the first thing I do is go to the site toilets because the condition of the site toilets will give you an indication of how health and safety is being managed across the rest of the site. Um, all you can say about this is it's ingenious. Okay? They have got warm running water. Uh, what can you say about this? It's revolting. And these facilities are out there, so this is a little oasis unit. Um, if you've got not much space, this is the kind of amount of space that we need to make sure is available for the contractor to set up his welfare facilities. Um, and this is quite uh, inventive again. Uh, it's a very short duration work. So they've used the port uh, which the HSC is acceptable for a week. But I'm sure we've all used port at festivals and acceptable as a kind of a loose term. Um, no space for it, so it's been put on the scaffolding. <clears throat> this is a port uh, solution, uh, but connected to proper services. And so whilst the port in of itself looks very compact, you've got all the other bits that go with it. Okay? So you've got the fuel, you've got the tank, and, and etc. And actually, it would have been easier just to bring an Oasis unit onto site. Okay? 
and the considerate constructor scheme is upping the standard so they're expecting showers on site um, again ingenious I think is the best way to describe it um, and some of the manufacturers this is Garrick uh, and you'll see these up, the, up and down the motorway these have got a little solar panel on the roof so that you've got you've got warm running water this one actually is, is a shower unit uh, as well so it's it's all doable so that's issues that we need to be considering as designers for the build mm -hmm. what I want to move on to now is the in use so CDM 2007 brought in an obligation on designers to think about people who would be using the structure as a workplace yeah. now um, that's none of us here today we're not using this structure as a workplace it is Margaret because Margaret works for UCL so CDM asks us and, and the AV guys thanks very much CDM asks us to think as designers to think about the people who are using the structure as a workplace CDM doesn't ask us to think about members of the public shoppers going to shops people using the streets all that. there are other legislation that requires that but CDM specifically asks us to think about people who are using the structure as a workplace and they refer us to the workplace health safety and welfare regulations that's the bit that sets the standard and the little three things I wanted to talk about one was Legionella confined spaces and then cleaning of the structure so if we look at the workplace health safety and welfare regulations there are 25 uh, regulatory provisions in the workplace health safety and welfare regulations as you can see these six relate to the provision of welfare facilities and these relate to, relate to ventilation uh, lighting and so on so in terms of lighting historically we would have used the in-plane roof light um, made of uh, plastic of some description the problem with that plastic is under UV degradation it becomes brittle it also becomes dirty these are, these are still visible it becomes dirty and when you go on the roof it's difficult to tell the difference between the roof and the roof light and if you step on the roof light you'll go through and tragically we get too many deaths of people who fall through these roof lights and get killed the workplace health safety and welfare regulations prioritize natural light for the workers over artificial light so there's a there's an encouragement to do that now these the upper sheets on the vertical here are also translucent sheets so they're providing natural light to the inside of the building it's a different quality of light to the in-plane roof light sheets but you can't fall through these ones no matter how brittle and fragile they become you can't fall through them because you can't walk on them and so that's a, a very simple CDM choice different quality of light safer design outcome you make your informed choice CDM doesn't prescribe which one you have to do <coughs> you make your informed choice this is Dunfermline in, in, in Scotland uh, we've got a landfill site picture on the top there is a landfill site extracting the methane off the um, decaying material we're burning the methane at the landfill site in some boilers creating hot water <coughs> which we're then pumping down to Dunfermline which is 10 miles away and using it in a district heating scheme what welfare provision do we have to make at the landfill site And to answer that question you'll be asking well who's up there okay. who's working up there so they've got two boilers up there um, they've got a, a pair of guys turns up once a week and they do a little bit of maintenance on the boilers they probably spend about half a day up there and they've come up in their van so what welfare provision would be appropriate well certainly they'd need a toilet and certainly they need some ability to wash up after they've done their work <clears throat> before they get back in their vans because otherwise they'll just contaminate the vans <clears throat> is it necessary to provide a kettle and a microwave it would be nice to provide a kettle and a microwave and somewhere where they could eat their sandwich but is it necessary that's a decision that you'd make as a designer the water's pumped down the road to the energy center it's concentrated in the thermal stores at the back so the general principles of physics the hot water rises to the top so at the top of the the thermal store it's it's pressurized the water gets up to about 108 degrees and then the hot water is drawn off from the top and pumped round the circuit 
Um, so in the, in the energy centre, there's a lot of electronics. There's some pumps, obviously, due to the standby pumps. Uh, there's some uh, water treatment uh, to reduce the, to change the, the pH of it. There's some cleaning facilities, etc., etc. What welfare for provision is required? So again, it comes back to the question about, well, who's that there and how often? So there's one chap there three days a week, maintaining the plant and going around and reading the heat meters in the other buildings. So clearly a toilet and wash hand basin necessary and in my opinion a canteen also appropriate. Uh, kitchenette, uh, sink, microwave, kettle, etc. A table, chairs, uh, you know, nothing extravagant but enough for, in or, from order to have you know, what we would expect somewhere decent to eat our, uh, half decent to eat our lunch. Yeah? The heat is then pumped out from the energy centre uh, and provides three, uh, heat to three blocks of flats the fire station, the swimming pool, the doctor's surgery, uh, old people's home, etc. In each of the buildings, there's a heat meter. Um, and one of the jobs that the, the, the chap has who's up there is to go around the buildings and read the heat meters every week. Yeah. Is it necessary to provide welfare facilities for him or her in each of those individual buildings? Yeah. What's he doing? Well, he or she will be there for about 10 minutes, read the heat meter move on to the next building. Working out of a base which is in the heart of the, the town, the energy centre, and in fact some of those facilities you're visiting will have welfare facilities. It's not a particularly dirty job and therefore uh, meeting the statutory requirements would be provided to provide nothing because he's got the base, he or she's got the base and then fire station, doctor's surgery, etc, old people's home can, can use the facilities there. So, so that's the, the um, Workplace Health, Safety and Welfare Regulations Requirement. We talked about Legionella earlier um, and the management of Legionella in live systems is about design. Um, so wet over dry, length of legs, materials chosen, um, flushing, isolation, etc. Um, and the guidance is all out there for the Health and Safety Executive. It's something that should be considered. It's normally considered anyway. Uh, I think it would be a CDM requirement to consider it anyway. Confined spaces, um, if we design places that become confined spaces then anybody who's going to enter them needs to know their confined spaces and needs to take the appropriate precautions. So on our eliminate reduce uh, premise then we would choose to make sure that places that could become confined spaces are naturally ventilated so that they're not confined spaces. So we were doing some public realm works up at uh, Ipswich in the town centre. We remodeled the town centre, put in some nice paving and water features. We had to have a plant room um, and despite our best endeavours, the plant room had to be underneath the town square. So it was enclosed space, it had plant in it, it had chemicals in it, it had all the potentials for becoming a confined space, but what we did was we built in passive ventilation so that the area, the fumes would never build up and it would never become a confined space. Okay, So design choices. And we also need to be thinking about how is the structure going to be cleaned whilst it's in use because cleaning is covered as one of the people, uh, groups of people we need to consider as designers. And in terms of guidance where we might look on for that, if we look at the, the cleanability awards, um, there are 66 judging criteria and we could work through those and say, well, so how does, our, how does our building design stack up against those criteria in terms of uh, being ability to clean it? And obviously different types of facilities have different standards of cleaning. So offices would have different to healthcare facilities, uh, would be different to laboratory facilities, etc. And then lastly, the third group of people we need to consider are the people who are going to carry out construction work after practical completion. People who are doing what I've called future construction work. Some work done by the Royal Academy for Engineering looking at buildings identified that for every pound that we spend building a building, we spend five pounds maintaining it. And from an ecological point of view, we spend 200 pounds um, running it. Um, and that's why we would be thinking about whole life costing, um, selecting uh, long life plant, etc. 
Um, but in terms of the construction and maintenance costs, uh, about 60 pence of the construction costs is um, labour and 40 pence, pence is materials. Quite labour intensive, the construction process. Uh, we're talking about that, modern methods of construction, off-site construction, etc., to try and reduce the on-site labour. But currently it's about 60-40. It's about labour, of course, being people exposed to risk. In terms of the maintenance costs, it's reckoned that about 45 pence of it is materials and £4.55 is labour. So you've got about 11 times um, um, the amount of people exposed to risk in maintaining a building as you've got in building it. Different risk profile, uh, different risks, but we need to be thinking about people who are maintaining the building, uh, carrying out construction work after practical completion and eventually demolishing it um, uh, because there's much more people exposed to risk over the life of the building. So in, main, in maintenance work, I want to touch again on solar radiation and manual handling. And for demolition, I want to talk about timber microwave waves and, and nanomaterials. Okay? So solar radiation. Um, we talked about having this uh, air conditioning plant in the basement rather than on the roof because of the risk of falling off the roof. But of course, if the air conditioning plant's in the basement, then the people are maintaining the air conditioning plant, they're not in, exposed to solar radiation. So that's one of the things that we could do. We could move the, the maintenance activities uh, into an internal space rather than external space to reduce the amount of solar radiation exposure that people have. In terms of manual handling, you know, one of the great choices that we make is reach and wash in terms of cleaning the structure because people are fixed on the ground when they're doing it um, and therefore we eliminate the work at height but we do create manual handling. Um, obviously at this level there's not particularly much manual handling uh, but when you get into these kind of extremes um, then there's quite a lot of manual handling associated with carrying out the task. This is Telford International Conference Centre I asked the chap how he liked his job, um, and he didn't really like his job, it had to be said, and that was largely around the manual handling side he had to do. So uh, this, the, it's claimed that these cleaning structures, these, these long pole cleaning systems, will work up to six storeys. Um, so you've got 60 feet of pole um, and a half inch hose or a, maybe a quarter inch hose of water feeding the top with the brush on the head. So quite quite a lot of manual handling um, involved. Uh, and we also need to think about where the, the cleaners are going to stand. So this is in Imperial uh, Road, opposite Imperial College, Exhibition Road, sorry. Um, this is in Southwark. Uh, and uh, I was going to say, fortunately, uh, a bus... Uh, this isn't in Southwark. Sorry. This one's in Smithfield. Uh, fortunately, there's no cars parked there that time because otherwise you wouldn't be able to clean the windows. Um, and this is in Southwark. Uh, uh, and a bus turned up whilst he was cleaning the, the structures. This is a, a boiler. Uh, the blue bit is a fan. The yellow bit is the gas supply. It brings the gas to the boiler. The fan blows the gas into the boiler, adds oxygen for the combustion process. And because the fan would need maintenance work, we might need to get into the boiler, the fan is hinged to eliminate the manual handling. So you can just unbolt the other side of the fan and you can hinge it round and you can do the maintenance on the, the fan, the blades, the motor, what have you. Or you could get into the combustion chamber, which would be a confined space, uh, and, and do any maintenance work there. Unfortunately, despite the fact that there's a, um, a point here where the gas could be connected, the designer, um, which was probably the gas fitter, has brought the gas supply around onto the wrong side of the of the fan. So now, when you have to take it, when you want to take advantage of the hinges and you take the fan out of place, you actually have to isolate the gas supply. You have to purge the gas supply. You have to deconstruct it. Then you can open the the fan, do the maintenance work, and come back. And so there's a question there about well, they're all we're all designers, we're all different levels of designers that hadn't been thought through. This is a, a thermal store, it's about four metres high, um, and this plate is an access plate should we need to get into the thermal store at some time 
uh, later on. And as you see, it, it's bolted. And it's got this gallows bracket on it, um, which is the arrow is pointing to here. So this gallows bracket, which takes the weight of the plate, so that if you wanted to take the plate off, you could undo all of the bolts, withdraw them, and the plate wouldn't move. And then you would move, use the gallows brackets, it would swing it out, and it would create the opening, and then you could go inside. So a really good piece of design, happens to be captured in the British Standard. So why hasn't this one got a gallows bracket, you ask? And the answer is because it's a smaller thermal store, less pressure, and the plate weighs less. I was talking to somebody, they shared their experience of, the, of this version with the thicker plate. The plate's about uh, 35, 40 millimetres thick, where an operative started undoing the bolts but hadn't been briefed. The gallows bracket wasn't there, and the last bolt was the bolt at the bottom. And as he took out the penultimate bolt, the plate just went and slipped round, and human nature, he put his hands out to grab the plate because uh, he thought it was falling, and he's now got two fingers less than he had before because it severed his fingers. Okay? So good design, sometimes there for a reason. Uh, I was at this, uh, uh, this building, I was looking at the, um, the escape stair, and uh, at the top of the escape stair, there's this beam, and the beam is marked safe working load one tonne. I thought, that's quite interesting, what's all that about? So I went round to the other side of the stair, and I see that the landing plates are hinged. So that when we need to replace some plant in the plant room, the people come along with a block and tackle, connect it up to the lifting beam, or they'd have to recertify it if it hadn't been certified in the last year. But then they can open the plates on the landings and hoist the materials up and down. So they've eliminated the manual handling wrist by designing in features to allow mechanical handling, a, a really good piece of design. Uh, in terms of demolition, um, in terms of timber, uh, if we're incorporating timbers in, there is a question mark still about MDF. Uh, it's banned for use in the States. Uh, there's a combination of the fact that the, the, the glue gives off organic compounds that some people are sensitive to and when you cut it it creates dust particles that are the same size as asbestos particles. They don't have the necessarily the same effects uh, and some of them are hardwoods um, and hardwoods dust causes uh, nasal cancer. Um, so that we need to think about that and some of the preservatives we've used um, in the first in application they're harmful but when you cut them later on you generate heat uh, you can create harmful particles as well. Uh, microwave dishes we talked about uh, and, and hidden aerials. Uh, this is um, a tower block in Newcastle and when you're in the plant room before you go onto the roof there's this label on the door which identifies that there's equipment on the roof that emits serious levels of microwaves um, and then when you get to, to that piece of plant on the roof there's an exclusion zone marked by a line painted on the roof. So again if we're installing that type of equipment we need to make sure that we've got the right information in place, both in situ and in the health and safety file. Um, and then lastly, in this section, I want to talk about nanomaterials. Nanomaterials uh, are causing harm, or potential to cause harm. There's no evidence yet, but there's a lot of concern about the size and the, and the active nature of the materials, uh, and if they're inhaled or, or ingested, the, the harm that might be caused. Loughborough University have done some research, uh, and as I say, they've, they've confirmed that the, the size is the question, but they haven't found any evidence yet that it's causing any harm to people. Um, nanocarbon tubes, they are worried about. So, so most of the materials that get into our lungs, our body can deal with. So we breathe in hardwood dusts, or, or any dust, to get into the, the body deals with it. If we breathe in too much, of course, we get into a, a COPD situation. But the carbon nanotubes are very, very hard, very durable. So the problem with, one of the problems with asbestos is when it gets into our lungs, we, our body can't deal with it, we can't break it down because it's a wonder material. The carbon nanotubes are the same. So they've got, a, how do you have a concern about breathing in carbon nanotubes? At the moment, they're suggesting that carbon nanotubes are too expensive for the construction industry to use. 
but I think it, it, it might be something that comes in. So an example of a nanomaterial would be self-repairing concrete, um, where the nanoparticles in it come back together. Um, Self-cleaning glass is, again, it's a nano material that's been applied to the surface. And, and they're kind of their general rule of thumb was, if it says it's got nano in it, it probably hasn't. It's probably just a marketing ploy to be with, you know, white heat of technology. As it's got nano. If it does something that it didn't used to do before, so some of the, the coatings, some of the materials we put up in kitchens, for example, which are antibacterial, uh, it probably has got nano in it. So self-cleaning glass, self-repairing concrete, some of the, they do things that they didn't used to do before, it's probably because they've got nanomaterials in them, okay? as have sunscreens and, uh, and other things. Okay? So, so nano is a, is a potential concern, it's an area to watch. Uh, that's a little example, uh, I'll not talk about that, you can read that yourself. Okay? Um, and in terms of demolition, how do we avoid noise, dust and vibration? Uh, you know, using water cutting methods um, are, are great to do that if we're designing, if we're designing the demolition. There's a nice little piece of kit there for crushing concrete, which doesn't create masses of noise, dust and vibration. Of course, what it's missing is the eye on the top. That means you can suspend it off a piece of plant. So it has created a manual handling risk, but it's, it's reduced the uh, noise, dust and vibration risk. So those are the things I wanted to talk about in terms of uh, what could de designers can do. I just want to give you some references to other documentation that you can look at. So the Association for Project Safety website, uh, we've got practice notes and what have you on the website that you can have a look at. The Health and Safety Executive website has been redesigned, more accessible. The sections for designers, sections for CDM on there you can look at. I mentioned the No Time to Lose campaign earlier. The four campaigns have been Asbestos, um, which, is, which is the current campaign, diesel energy exhaust emissions, solar radiation, and silica dust. Lots and lots of resources on those. The Breathe Freely Clean Air Take Care campaigns, again, are about the general dusts. Uh, you can find those on the website, the British Occupational Hygiene Society, the British Safety Industry Federation uh, on there. It's in your hands, again, about dermatitis, as, as the name suggests. Um, the British Safety Industry Federation website you'll find something there about that as well I listen today here tomorrow uh, again British Safety Industry Federation talking about noise induced hearing loss and what we can do on the health and safety executives websites they've got some rag lists some red amber and green lists aimed at designers uh, and the red list suggests things that designers shouldn't do uh, the green list is things that designers should do because they're bad and good for health and safety respectively and the constructing Better Health website uh, has got lots of materials about uh, health uh, effects. Uh, the APS have produced the Principal Designers Handbook, uh, which can be purchased from the APS or through RIBA Publications, which has got something in it. The, the rag lists I talked about, and I'll just show you what they look like. So they're just uh, a list of things that, that we shouldn't do. So for example, uh, we'll find here somewhere uh, blocks that weigh more than 20 kilos because it's something we, we shouldn't do. Um, the amber list, things we should try to avoid doing. Oh, the blocks that weigh more than 20 kilos are here. And then the green list, things that are positively good to do. Um, so thinking about the plant, design plant rooms so mechanical fixing aids can be used. half size plasterboard sheets are there um, as well. So those are the topics that, that I've covered. Um, any questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. May I encourage you to have more to do with working well together. Um, follow the, us on the website. I want to thank again UCL for hosting us and Overbury for providing the refreshments. Um, have a safe journey home wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind.